everybody. It's uh, 7.30, so we're going to start uh, tonight. We are going to have a, a joint meeting in a few minutes with the uh, Central Bus Business Architecture Committee. Uh, but to begin, we're going to open up uh, the planning board here. We've got some uh, administrative uh, issues to deal with, so we'll start with that first. But before we get to that, we have the public sharing portion of the evening. So is anybody here in the audience have anything, any comments on anything that uh, does not relate to what we're going to talk about later tonight? If you do, just raise your hand. I don't think we ever have. And if not, we'll get started. Okay, so we're going to jump in our first uh, order of business tonight, scheduled for 7:30, is a request by the Clark School for the amendment to a permit to extend the time to start the construction of the parking lot at 47 Round Hill Road, Northampton Map ID 31B-064. Um, so Carolyn can walk us through what. Sure. being requested <clears throat> so <clears throat> the board approved site plan two years and a little bit ago for um, it was all part of the consolidation of Clark School um, from all the buildings on Round Hill Road to the one Bell Hall building and they were going to be bringing all the staff over to um, park behind that one building so the board approved the permit they haven't had to um, construct the lot yet and so they bumped up against their expiration um, they have two years to substantially start a project once the board issues the permit um, <clears throat> so they're here in front of you actually if, uh, effectively the the permit did expire in between the time they submitted their application in this hearing so um, it, essentially the request would be to officially reissue the permit nothing's changed um, and then so the applicants here to sort of describe maybe why they haven't done it maybe what their time frame is but that's generally what it is pretty straightforward okay and Rick you're for Clark School sure I'm Rick Klein uh, partner of the Berkshire Design Group on behalf of the Clark School um, the, while the permit was issued as you know Opal had purchased part of the Clark School and as a um, interim move the Opal development offered parking to the Clark School because there's ample parking up there while they were working on buildings and so on. And as many of you might be aware, it's been slow to get started up there on the Opal side of things, and there's still plenty of parking available. So Clark has just gone along parking basically without having the expense of building the parking lot. And at some point that will change shortly. So what we'd like to do tonight is ask for an application extension or actually maybe a new permit to be reissued like this just so we have a little bit more time to be able to build the parking. So it's not truly an extension of a permit it's a whole new permit right you would reissue a permit and then it has a new date a new you know start date essentially so then mm -hmm. therefore another two-year extension mm -hmm. Mark, do they repay the application fee and does that run the, clock the for amendment two years, just like you would have, or, or I mean do I think about it as a whole separate permit no I mean it you know if they had um, moved a little more quickly they would have come in and still asked for an amendment essentially <coughs> same fee um, but then you still would have issued an amended permit that gets recorded at the Registry of Deeds. Um, the bottom line is, you know, just to, to carry that um, record through on the property to show that the permit's still valid. Mm -hmm. I might point out, too, that there was a stormwater permit um, approved by this by the City of Northampton, which is still in effect for another three years. For three more years? Yes. Are there any other permits that were part of this process? Any questions by the board? Seems pretty straightforward. That had it been submitted as an amendment, we wouldn't have any reason not to have approved it. So, I move we approve the request for extension. Project is unchanged. Go ahead. One. Yeah, oh, I need I'm to sorry. close public comment close first. Public comment. A motion to close public comment. Motion to close public comment. Okay. Second. Second. All in favor. Okay, now, uh, now discussion, any discussion? No? Okay. Now I move that we uh, print the request of the uh, Clark School for an amendment to permit to extend the time to start the construction of the parking lot at 47 Round Hill Road, Northampton, map ID 31B064. Thanks. Second. Yeah. Discussion? No? All in favor? Okay, Thank here you go, Rick. Thank you. Yeah. Right on. Okay, Alon, you want to open up uh, 
um, Sure, so this is the, the joint session um, between the Central Business Architecture Committee and the Planning Board. Um, this meeting was published on October 30th and November 6th, and it is to review a special permit for greater than five feet front setback and site plan review by HAP Incorporated for construction of 64,250 square feet uh, five-story building and site layout at 129 to become, <coughs> excuse me, 155 Pleasant Street, Northampton, map 32C-58. Um, so start by opening <coughs> up to the uh, applicant to present the project. Mm -hmm. um, we have more materials to hand out last minute. I hope you forget this. Is it possible to turn out some of these lights so that the uh, <coughs> yeah the switch is behind you at the at the back of the door? I think the one to closest to the door is one. Still one. Or, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Good evening, uh, the gentleman. Just handing around. This is Doug Dick. He's in. Next to him is Naomi Cottrell. She's a landscape architect. <coughs> Steve D'Ambrosio is a civil engineer. I'm Peter Frothingham, also an architect. And Peter Serafino is the project manager <coughs> for HAP, who is the applicant tonight. Um, rather than grace you with a long and exhausting detailed presentation, we're just going to do a quick overview of <coughs> the building design, the site context, the landscape design, the civil engineering, and then wrapping up with the plaza design in front of the building. And then we're eager to answer your specific questions once we get through that. I'm presuming that technology works for us tonight. So this is an overview of the site currently. Uh, to orient ourselves, this is Main Street along through here, King Street up through here. Can people see this mouse running around? Okay. That's the railroad, rail trail, train station, garage. This is our site. And in particular, one of the things we notice is how what's north of that rail trail is primarily large, close buildings. And what's outside of that are primarily small, separated buildings. I mean, there are exceptions. You've got uh, Sylvester's in here, the condos down there. North is up on this, as you probably have figured out. <clears throat> 120 years ago, this is the same area. Uh, Pleasant Street's here. The rail trail then was rails. And the Mill River was running right through here, you know, next to the site and then heading south. Probably some of the reason that we have smaller, more separate buildings out here is because that Mill River was occasionally ill-behaved, exceeding its banks. I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, um, should I move this closer? Is that any better? Nope. Is this on? Apparently. All right. I'll speak louder. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> The city, as you know, has resent, you know, revised its zoning to accommodate the sustainability plan that it's implemented. And part of how they've done that is to increase the size of buildings allowed and to decrease the parking required. And this is part of why. Our site is right in here. And this arc is about a five minute walk. And there are over 1,500 1, parking spaces within that five minute walk that are available at night for free or monthly parking pass. Particularly here, these two long term parking spaces or parking lots right down the bike path from the site. And there's a great deal to walk to from here. We've got the post office up here, CVS is in here, Cereos Market and Pharmacy. State Street Liquors and Fruit Store, Public Libraries right there, City Hall, the bus station, Pulaski Park, the train station over here. 
and not to mention there are bus stops right in front and more than a few restaurants. This is the uh, site as it exists now. The bike path is along here to the south of the site. Along here is the frontage on Pleasant Street. This is the overgrown building, or sorry, overgrown tree behind which is this building. Uh, dormitory building, two and a half stories tall, three floors of dorm rooms, including the basement. There's uh, one bathroom on each floor. There's one kitchen in the building. And the building's in disrepair. So, Hap intends a new building. It meets the city's sustainability goals, as well as the CVAC design goals, as well as providing a facility in which HAP can provide affordable apartments, as well as counseling services. Again, I think this is where I toggle between. And it worked. Yes. So we're intending a new building in this area, Pleasant Street again, bike path. And if I do this right, Yes. You can see how the proposed building fills in a gap that's in that edge I was talking about of the more dense, taller, closer buildings. And as we get a bit closer, we can talk a little bit more about the building so far as it returns the 58 apartments that are in the current building and it adds 14 more. It replaces the vacant side yard with up to four storefronts of retail. It adds a traditional facade along the Pleasant Street that's in the similar size of its neighbor adjacent to it and across the way. There's a sort of urban woodland experience to be enjoyed along the bike path and we begin to bring that out in front of the building. In addition, to increasing the width of the sidewalk, we provide a sitting plaza in this area and an art or parklet along here. Doug, this would be a good place for you to step up because um, I'm starting to run out of wind. If you want, you know. Sure. Okay. So let me just get this. So a little bit co closer view reveals a couple of things. Here's the, the, uh, one of the parklets and entrance to the building. We'll get into that more later. Note the very busy roofscape. These are uh, is an, a large array of solar panels, which will provide a fairly good portion of the electricity for the building. These little objects are rooftop condensing units. And if we were to zoom in a little closer, you'd see some three foot tall exhausts and intake um, pipes on the, on the roof as well. And also right there, a little penthouse for the elevator. And take note of those because once we go down to the street level, uh, you'll see that you'll no longer be able to see them because they're very low profile. And uh, also they're set back from the edge of the building and we have a small parapet that begins to screen them. The other thing I wanted to point out was there's some uh, co context uh, feature or there's some contextual issues that we're trying to relate to with the building. This, this portion, of course, is the facade that uh, addresses the street, uh, responding to the precedent of some of the commercial buildings on Main Street and Pleasant. This area right here, and maybe you can zoom around, Peter, is a courtyard we've created to provide plenty of open space and light for this building, which are also apartments, five stories, and also for the proposed building. You can see as well that we've tried to break the building into uh, four basic masses, this being one here, See if we can do this together. Yeah, let's we'll see if you get seasick, let us know. Um, the second mass, the third mass, and the fourth mass. And the reason for doing that is to, even though it is a fairly large structure, is to create a scale that's more complementary to the context. And the next one? Yeah. Okay. So this takes us down to street level, uh, to the south on Pleasant Street. And what we're trying to point out is kind of the, the phenomenon that Peter suggested, these are the 
individual freestanding buildings as we move down Pleasant Street towards the more urban area of Main Street, you begin to see this traditional front, five stories like the, the existing building next to it, begins to create that more, that slightly denser, taller urban fabric. Okay. Um, once again, <coughs> you're beginning to now finally be able to see the uh, facade that's facing towards the bike path. And we'll get into materials in a bit, but the buff really represents the brick portion of the building, traditionally detailed. This is also brick. And the gray is a, uh, a cementitious panel, which we can show you samples of, that extends along the bike path and then around and into the courtyard where it's not seen so much from the street. Okay, uh, this is the view that begins to introduce the main the street <coughs> facade from the parking lot at the uh, train station, and here you can begin to see the composition of the facade, a first floor retail area with one, two, three, four potential retail entrances with, we're proposing uh, a canopy and then a, a band for signage for the retail. Um, as you can see, we've introduced some uh, um, detail in the brick where the, the brick is stepped back in increments of a half to uh, three quarters of an inch to create these pilasters, kind of a A, B, A rhythm, and with paired up double hung windows in the front typically with some singles and then we create a belt course that begins to respond to the scale of the building next to it. Uh, it's a little, the belt course is a little lower. And then the top floor features a cornice, uh, painted metal cornice that's inspired by some of the context buildings on Main Street. This is a feature I want to point out. This setback area is the entrance into the, uh, the apartment uh, portion of the building. So this is retail. This is the public and this is the entrance to the apartments and also the offices that HAP will have in the building where they provide services and management. And then this is the rail trail. Right. And, I mean, and I want to interject here that uh, next week, Peter Serafino and I are meeting with the Northampton Arts Council because we're discussing this area as a location for public art in addition to, well, you get the idea. Okay. And I think we can flip over to the PowerPoint then. Okay. Ah. So, yeah, that's good. There we go. Yeah. So getting back to the facade, this is a little the, the little more representative of how the landscape will work with the facade. And Naomi will be getting into this area, which is very important to the project. I just wanted to point out here that this setback area is brick like the facade. It's a buff brick. Um, and it keeps some of the uh, important uh, alignments with the main traditional facade, but it begins to become a little more abstract as we move back to the, the, the more contemporary parts of the building. And then a feature that's a little hard to see here, but you see right there is another um, thin wall of brick, and then there's another one behind that to begin to take the, the street facade material and bring it back in towards the rear of the building. Okay. Um, so just a bit about so you can, you know, the building so you can see how it works. This is Pleasant Street. This is the retail portion. So it's, it's basically wide open retail space with up to four tenants with those four openings. This is the setback area where you'd enter into the building. For the apartments, the, these are the HAP offices where they provide services, a workshop uh, to maintain the building and others in Northampton. And then on the first floor, we have some uh, one bedroom and studio apartments. On the second through fourth floors, it's, com it's completely residential with one bedroom and studio apartments. As, as well Oops. as, I'll point it out here, uh, there are some shared common spaces for, uh, because the apartments are small, it allows people to meet and gather within the building on each floor, as well as kind of a common work area here and a laundry there. And the fifth floor is a partial floor with the same uh, um, program elements. The roof plan, once again, all of these are solar panels. These are the uh, mechanical units and the penthouse. And as you can see, they're all set back. Uh, so I can barely read these here, but the height of the building, the, the cornice line is right at 60 feet. So that's this line right here. And we have a couple, the wing walls extend up just slightly. 
to about 63 feet. Right. This, this is the area Peter was mentioning where we hope to incorporate art into the building. Um, the storefront, once again, it's the buff brick. Uh, the windows are uh, double hung. They will be black. Uh, the storefront is aluminum. It will be painted uh, a deep gray. We've got samples over here of that. Um, and it, um, all glass storefront, clear glass. And a lot of the uh, proportions from the windows and the pilasters and so on come out of the guidelines for the uh, CBAC district. Yeah, We're sort of mixing. Yeah, OK. So looking quickly at some precedents, one thing that we've looked at is this combination of different types of brick in, in the central business district area, uh, red brick, brown brick, orange brick, as well as some buff bricks. These are some examples of the buildings that we've taken uh, we've looked at hard. This one's a buff brick. Similar proportions on the openings. Similar height of the cornice. Thank you. Uh, another example with uh, retail signage canopies. Buff brick. Another buff brick building. And the buff brick buildings tend to be sprinkled in, we've found, just um, as, as we've looked at the downtown area, within areas of, of predominantly red brick. And the area where exist, the existing buildings around the proposed site is also red brick. So we'll be kind of that um, unique uh, but not unusual um, buff brick that's mixed into the, to the streetscape. Um, another point that you'll see in the next elevation, a lot of the existing buildings on Main Street and Pleasant have the beautiful face brick that turns the corner it stops, and then you get the mo more prosaic material behind that. Same with this. There's, there's a couple of examples of that. Uh, another example here, the face brick turns a corner and a more inexpensive prosaic brick behind it. Um, an example of a, a, more, a recent addition where, of course, the red brick at the street and then a more contemporary series of materials further back where they're less a part of the street experience. This is the facade on the uh, Manham uh, Rail Trail. And you can see how we're taking the face brick, turning the corner, and then transitioning to uh, a less expensive, more prosaic material again with a series of these brick fin walls that, that helps us make the transition from the uh, street facade brick to more affordable materials, which are important when you're building <laughs> affordable housing. And another thing to mention is how on the Pleasant Street side, the facade is organized in a much more human scale. And as you turn the corner, this fronts on a more transportation-oriented context, you know, the Mill River, the railroad, the um, bike path. So we're working with a different scale and a different vocabulary and to respond to that context. And you can begin to see how we're trying to break down the size of this long facade. Remember, the, the, the building actually steps back on this facade right at each of these brick features. And then there's a combination of a light and a darker uh, cementitious panel material. Once again, black double hung windows. And this is the courtyard side, which is really hard to see from the street. And it's the most uh, cost effective uh, exterior material, which will be a painted cement uh, siding with, with some of the uh, the same base material that you saw on the bike trail side. Uh, this is the west side. It's very hard to understand in this image, so we'll, we'll look at this in, in, the in the 3D model. I think you'll understand it more. But this is the courtyard here. This is the bike path, which you can see is raised up above uh, the, the grade of the rest of the property. Um, and why don't, why don't we go ahead and look at the rest of the flip to the SketchUp model here quickly, Peter. Let's just walk through that, and then we'll go back to the landscape. It's not going. Yes. There we go. There we go. So why don't you click to the next one? OK. Um, so this shows uh, the, the other side of this transition from the uh, brick, face brick on the street side to the, uh, the more prosaic material. Let me back up one. No, nope. keep going. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, so this is further back from the train station area. You can begin to see how the brick uh, part, the brick uh, wing walls carry that, the front facade material back into the rear of the property. And also how the cornice line fits into the city skyline. Yeah, we go. 
Okay, this now shows the, this is the west side of the building, so it makes a little more sense. This is the bike path, which is raised up, and you can see the first floor of the building is really behind an existing granite wall that's back here. And so we've created a base that is reminiscent of the, the, the medium dark granite that exists right now. And go back to the yeah. PDF? Yes. Yeah, now we'll turn it over to Naomi to talk about the landscape. Do you want to push on buttons? Sure. <laughs> I'll let you stand here though if you want. <laughs> so I'm just going to uh, start just by showing this existing plan that you, you are all familiar with, with the existing uh, building and the predominance of the interior of the site being asphalt parking. Um, with really no uh, street presence with the large tree and actually a uh, um, railroad tie wall that elevates the site from, from the sidewalk. Um, with the, uh, the bus stop here, this is an area where people do congregate. Um, and so we want to make sure that we keep an element of public gathering um, for that as well as trying to relate to uh, the existing end of the rail corridor here, which is also has benches and some other public uh, amenity. So this is the, the illustrative site plan showing um, the textures and, and the way in which materials will work. Uh, and I'll toggle back and forth just so that you can see a more technical plan along with the illustrative plan. Um, one thing to note is that we have a three foot grade change from this side of the site um, to the lower um, on the south on the south here and um, with keeping uh, handicap accessibility we actually have the sidewalk remaining at, at that sloped condition and then we have um, we have created a uh, an entry sidewalk along the building that is accessible and therefore have created um, two different entries up into the building with steps uh, and using the same material um, and hopefully reclaimed some of the material from uh, the existing granite wall that's along this edge here and wrapping the building with that same material and taking the idea of this more urban wild with um, the, the birch groves on the side of the building and again wrapping it here to make this entry um, to signify the entry as something special um, and then also making it different from what's a more public gathering on on the the north side of the site um, which would be quite open um, with seat walls uh, and some lower planting to um, encourage <coughs> gathering uh, in, on this side. Um, the this, this side of the site here is a more utilitarian um, side with a uh, dumpster and allowing for service to come in on the driveway and then back up and to be able to head back out. Um, and we have... Uh, planned for parking in here, which would be more temporary loading and unloading for people who, who live here as well as for people who shop here. Um, in the material selection, we've tried to keep things um, affordable, yet also thinking about the way in which stormwater would work. So the parking here, we're proposing uh, an eco paver, which would have a porous center and, um, and, and planting. Uh, the same for this back area, um, which would be the main gathering space for folks who uh, reside in, in the apartments. And having a traditional mown lawn for part of, of the rear of the site, and then having a, um, uh, a mix of uh, a more um, taller grass with some wildflowers that would allow for um, this low point to take on water. Um, and, and temporary store it in during storm, um, and having that, this whole edge along with the eco paver being a little bit more porous. The uh, connection to Main Street and to downtown, very important, so we have um, a more casual path that leads through this area, um, <coughs> as well as then also allowing for this area that's temporary loading and unloading and turning to function as a gathering plaza for people who, who live in the building to have um, an outdoor uh, recreation and gathering space. Can I jump in here? Yep. Minute? One of the things we also want to point out is that we've provided a fair bit of bike rack along here that's under a canopy, that's what that dashed line is. There's some more mm -hmm. intended along here. And depending 
in the future of how this bike path resolves itself, we may have more bike racks in this area as well. So I'm just going to move to quick to some some material. Um, again, this is the eco paver. Uh, the the places that we would be using brick as paving mm -hmm. are very specialized locations. So really, um, to highlight the entry um, here, the the site along um, the more public side uh, would be a, a concrete. But we're proposing a concrete with. Um, s interesting score joints to, to make it a little bit more special. Uh, this is the existing um, granite block wall uh, along the rail corridor, so we're proposing that as a continued um, character along the front. Um, and then some slides here just of some of the plant material. We do have, and I'll toggle back to the to the plan, we do have some existing um, honey locust. We have some existing maple that we want to keep. So we want to add to those um, larger canopy trees along this side of the building to give a little bit of <coughs> privacy and screening um, between uh, the two the two buildings. Um, and then along the front of, of the building, um, having some lower scale uh, native uh, service berry or um, some uh, red bud for some of the gathering spots and then along the rail corridor having a uh, birch that can um, grow well sucker um, sort of take over in in the the tight the space between the rail corridor and the building um, and it would be they would be planted within a gravel base so that there was more possibility for uh, slower infiltration of stormwater some of our ideas about ground cover, the ground cover at the front of the building being, uh, again, uh, a grass, whether it was Pennsylvania sedge um, or another native um, ornamental grass. And then uh, in the back, the combination of a mown lawn and a more native uh, lawn that can take on water. And then this is just some detailed shots of, of the proposal for the front along Pleasant Street, um, showing the seat walls made out of the block granite, um, the, the stairs being brick, the, the corridor back to the residential entry also being brick. Um, we have uh, incorporated then seating from the upper uh, sidewalk along the retail elevation as well as in places um, from the street side. You can see this is a perspective here again with this is the entry to uh, the building. We've got the vegetation and the character from the rail corridor side of things wrapping around the front of the building and then the entrances into the storefronts. Thank you. And Peter, maybe you should mention it, um, about the reason for the special permit to push the building back from the Sure. Um, there's a five foot build to line, and actually, Carolyn was the source of this where she suggested that we could address some of our accessibility issues by pushing the building further away and applying for the special permit. It also helps the city insofar as it creates more of a plaza experience along the uh, now mostly state highway experience of um, Pleasant Street. I think this is where I get myself in trouble. <laughs> because it's a uh, good way to bring up the dry topic of storm drainage. Dry? Come on. <clears throat> Steve D'Ambrosio, uh, professional engineer with GZA. I was involved with the stormwater management of the site. Uh, the site is approximately 32,000 square feet. In the existing condition, there's about 16,000 square feet of impervious. So it's half impervious in the existing condition. In the proposed condition, uh, we're adding 5,500 additional square feet of impervious. So we do need to do some stormwater management. Uh, what we're proposing is to take the roof runoff and send it into an underground infiltration system. Uh, that system is just going to be a 190 linear foot, 12 inch pipe uh, in a stone trench, uh, about three and a half feet deep, three and a half feet wide. Uh, we're collecting surface runoff through multiple catch basins. Uh, there's one here, here. And in the rear of the building, uh, we're looking to pick up additional drainage uh, with some smaller catch basins. And we're going to route that towards the front of the building. Uh, this will be an outlet control structure where we'll try to backwater the system uh, and infiltrate before overflowing into the, the city's existing uh, drainage. 
What we're looking to do is connect into an existing stormwater pipe. Uh, we have to do a little bit more investigation on that pipe. Uh, if for some reason that pipe turns out to be insufficient or in ill repair, um, part of the documents that were submitted to you this after or this evening include an alternate design, which will basically eliminate this cat, uh, this manhole and place a new manhole in the street. The reason why we're trying to use this existing service, or connection rather, is because this pipe within the street is a large pipe. Uh, it's a 60 inch diameter pipe. So the size of your structure would have to be about an eight foot diameter manhole. And we're looking to avoid uh, that construction work in the street. So uh, the thought is to get a little bit more information on this pipe, work with DPW, um, and make sure that, that this is a viable uh, approach. In the event that it isn't, then we'll go this other route and include uh, a large manhole here. So the system itself isn't going to change, but the connection point may, if required. Um, other utilities, uh, there's an existing uh, sewer connection that we're looking to reuse. Um, and with some back and forth with, uh, or some recent correspondence with DPW, there is an existing uh, four inch water service that comes into the site here. Uh, we are proposing to use um, a new four inch service off the existing line for domestic and then use uh, the existing service that comes into the site for fire protection. DPW has requested that we use the existing, there's an existing uh, six inch tap, uh, tapping valve and sleeve. They would like us to bring that connection into the site, tap off of that new connection with a domestic. So you'll have a six inch fire service and off of that will be the new four inch domestic. And I apologize, the sewer is down here. This is the sanitary connection. These are the two connections, which are now going to be shown as, as one connection. Do you need to jump in? No. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, gas will be connecting to the existing gas. And site electric, uh, we're looking to remove a few of the, there's a utility pole in this area uh, that we'll be looking to remove and bring new service into the site to a new transformer. Underground service. Yes, that'll be an underground service to a new transformer. And uh, there's also a new uh, emergency generator that's proposed here. And I believe that's it from the civil standpoint. You're right. So, back to the model. Right? But not that view. Do you want to? Is that a good one to segue to for you? Sure. I mean, I think we're going to wrap that one. Wrap it up. Mm -hmm. So I, I, just to, to wrap it up, as far as our, our work here, we felt like we wanted to end on what this does for Pleasant Street and especially for the public experience um, with the contextual, all of, trying to, to meet a lot of and, and blend with a lot of contextual um, elements of the of the corridor providing uh, and really encouraging uh, more street life here uh, and really opening things up for public uh, use and gathering I go back I don't know if you have another rendering after this or not. okay so that's basically our question. Um, hopefully you're not asleep. but we're uh, happy to answer questions. Questions from the board. Peter, I've got, I've got one just to get us going. In the, in the back of the lot where the dumpsters are and so forth, what's the grading from the front of the street back to the dumpsters? Water, snow removal. You're talking about uh, trying to get water back there and... and You're talking yeah, about back in here? Exactly. It's pretty much a flat site. Um, I think there's a low point right in here. Mm -hmm. It's all within a few feet of each other. Uh, I know that we're intending for the snowplow storage, you know, snow storage to happen in this area as we have that opportunity. Does that answer your question? Base, yeah, if it's snow storage, snow removal, yep. water. I'm just envisioning issues in the winter, yep. basically because of the grading. So essentially the retail floor is about six inches lower than the residential floor. 
all of the site drains away from either one of these. In this case, it drains towards the street, and this one it drains back towards this low point here. But it's a pretty flat site, really. Are you doing the material reviews now, or are you saving that for part of the presentation? Um, we brought these to answer specific questions if people have. Um, I think we can go to the elevations and talk about where the particular materials are in those elevations, if that's helpful. I think it would be great to talk about how you, you've got a variety of uh, materials and sure. where the transitions happen. We'll go back to the PowerPoint. To, yeah. Yeah, we can grab the material boards. Okay. I, I, do we want to just go everybody yeah, I mean, we can, in together? We, yeah, that's fine. So why don't we start with this, uh, the main facade. So why don't you... Yeah, I don't know, but the best place for Peter to stand for everyone to see it. Should we step up closer? Uh, maybe we should let that. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so that, right. Is that the <coughs> star? Do you have more samples on that? Yep. That's it. Solid on coming. Yeah. <laughs> and the cornice. And the cornice above. Yes. And the window, we've got a little corner sample, but basically the window's black in that. And, um, and then, there we go. Okay. okay. This is actually the interior. Exterior, but it's black. It's a double hung window. We have a sample of the storefront. If the interior is black? Or the interior, exterior, is black? exterior is black. Both are, actually. Both are, well. Yeah, but on this one, because we couldn't get a sample, it was all black. Okay, they're black though. Yes. They're black. The windows Sorry. are black. And <laughs> and you saw on the other model that the storefront is slightly lighter, somewhat of a gray to work better with the cornice. And then Okay. These are the uh, we have a photo of the installation. Yes. Yeah. So this, let me just bring this up as well so we can kind of see the two together. Okay. So, these are kind of the reinforced plank. Up to the elevation. That, uh, yeah. It's a vented rain screen installation. So, you can just take it off. I understand. Just the lighter part. It comes in two different finishes. There's a more matte and a more rough finish. And it lays up very much like a giant brick. And it has a lot of texture to it as it goes up. This is a different core color emission. This is the idea. You do get that variation. Which so it's like variegated. Yep. Yeah, variegated. Mm -hmm. This is actually a photograph of a building mm -hmm. uh, near my uh, near our office in Cambridge. Uh, it's really a. It's a very rich surface, which these samples don't give you the sense of, which is why we mm -hmm. this one. But as you see in the brick, there's sort of a gray iron spot in it, which mm -hmm. segues to the more gray. I'm just, as a builder, I'm just curious. Are those applied like with a mortar, like a, a thin set mortar, like an applied? It's what's a rain it, what's this? Yeah. Oh, it's so on a. Okay. It's, on, it's a rain screen. Okay. So it sits on the Perlin's office. Peter, can yeah. you it's flip around for the rest of this? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> pitching to the right crew. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the facade brick, and these are the cement panels. This is a photograph of the poor color rendition, but it shows the vari variation of the the cement panels when they're uh, installed together. So you get a very rich and not these. mono, mono these. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. these right. are in this area. Right. And that bit is these areas. Yeah. Okay. And the main facade of the top. Well, where's yes. the variegated part? Uh, well, all of this, it doesn't show up so much in the rendering here. But when it's installed, the real product has a lot of variety to it. It, it doesn't show here. No, it doesn't no show but so in the picture, here. in the photograph, you can see there's. In the photograph, it's a whole different color, too, though. Right. So that's, that's their terra color. These are silver gray, and you can feel what the other one is. But it has this, you know, it has the variation that you get in brick, but on uh, just a much larger scale. The four different colors are for the different setbacks. Exactly. Got and it. And they're actually, yep. they're actually two different colors, and we've used them in kind of a varying. The texture then. Yeah. Yeah. You're using both textures also. Yes, we are. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. But each each section has a is uniform in texture. It's just, mm. or are they 
Well, that comes mixed out together. a little bit. They mix together like these. Yeah. So the textures are mixed within yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. I'm just trying to understand yeah. that. Yeah. So we leave it to the uh, civil engineers to have the answer to your question about this. That's how they connect. So this is that. These things are six feet long, about six inches tall. And then they have a through connection. Oh. And what? The and, so they, and part of the reason we chose them is they have a more mm -hmm. substantial look than Clapper. Is that going anywhere? That's on the inside. That's the courtyard side. That's the part you don't see from the street. That's this side. Are, yep. ooh, ooh. are you saying that on Peter? Yeah. Are you saying that on one, like on this surface, you're going to get all four of those colors? Yes. I'm saying that on that light gray field, mm -hmm. you're going to get both of these. Both of these, but yeah. I'm not not the. And then the dark, dark is and this the dark one. Part, you're going to get both right. of these. Okay. And then mm -hmm. the blonde part, you'll get. But there's as much, but within within a piece of this, there's as much variation as there is on that yeah. photograph. Yes. yes. And the variation of texture yeah. also. Um, yeah, that, that would really enrich it. Can you talk well, about the courtyard depends. size? Um, yes. I mean, is that really what you're doing as, as a class? Well, to be honest with you, we felt that the, our understanding is that it wasn't part of a public way, so we don't have that one as resolved as we do the other parts. Okay. It's not something that you could see from the street at all. You'll get a glimpse as you're going down Pleasant Street. The, uh, if you look past uh, the trees and so on. Mm -hmm. I just. Uh, but it's incidental. I, yeah. Put it that way. Considering the rear of the building is such a contemporary look, I, I find the uh, make believe textured wood pattern doesn't look <laughs> very good on that clabbered material. And I, I would it's sense good. a flat material would go more with the nature of, the build, of that part of the building. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I agree with that. Yeah. Even those hardy panel systems, like the, 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 the commercial hardy panel, yeah. the larger mm -hmm. systems. You know, the I think texture is no way to go on this. Um, it, it just. You know, that just looks like raw wood out there. Um, but I, I think a smoother texture, uh, the hardy plank type look. Yep. So you this only see a very Yeah, this is, this is this describes what you can see of that. You, so you can see it in the back. It's kind of um, this area that I'm pointing <clears throat> at with the, the cursor is, is the cement uh, variegated panels that we're presenting. And then in the far back, we've got a combination of those the darker of the horizontal cement panels, and then this lighter material is the cement uh, uh, clapboards, which I, th I agree would look very much more appropriate in a smooth finish. Well, excuse me, what would you say is more appropriate? Smooth, um, smooth versus the. You said the smooth is more appropriate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. Instead well, of using you, this. You're saying a clapboard, but you have the clapboard within those panelized, the vertical. Yeah, we were yes, exactly. Partitions. The detail where every four feet there was a vertical um, aluminum so that it doesn't take on quite the house rhetoric. Mm -hmm. It has a more uh, pronounced, more urban quality. Yeah. So, so, so in. Labor yeah. Uh, perhaps. Unless perhaps. So that's so that's you set up a jig and cut panels. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you can, you, can you can see in this view, <coughs> we're trying to relate to that, to the approach that's been used everywhere, really, in, in turn of the century buildings or before, with the, the beautiful face brick that transitions to the more basic, affordable material. And in our case, the more basic, affordable material is this rather than brick. But then once you yes. turn that corner and get into the courtyard, we go to a clever. Does that material just come in gray? This, this one here? Yeah. Or are there choices of colors beyond gray? There are gray? choices. Eight. Um, Peter told me I can't use lime green. <laughs> um, well, <you're> <laughs> and then uh, there's also a white that is hard to keep clean. There's some reds and some browns. Peter, there's a, on that sample board on the left exposed fasteners. Is that your left? This one, right there. Yeah. yeah. So every one of those panels has an exposed. They would have probably six. You can see the natural. Oh, okay. I'm seeing it. And it actually adds a little bit of detail and shadow line, which is really part of what enlivens the surface. Okay. But well, they're proud of the, <coughs> just like that, yeah. just that, that. It's okay. Sort of a battleship text. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> could, could I see that close up? Yes, sir. <coughs> part of show the south-facing facade again. 
Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so this is these things are going to be on this yeah. side and on this side. Primarily on this side. On this side, yeah. but not on. Not on. Right. This is the clapper. So set up in four foot line. the areas behind the buff um, are not going to be I, quite as uniform as they appear. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's that's what we're trying to show with this, and that's the limitation of of our rendering there. But they will be. The, the surface is much more varied like this. Both in texture and in tone. Yeah, exactly. In texture because you have the two different kinds, right? Yeah, this is, these are the, right, you get, <coughs> the, actually the difference in texture is what makes the difference in color. Oh, right. Uh, and these colors were really chosen because as much as anything, they work uh, better with the brick palette that we're working with and the grays and the, the um, in the cornice and then the, the grays in the storefront. Do you think that standing 100 or 200 feet away from the building, one would notice the difference in textures? I don't, I don't think you notice the difference in texture. I think you notice the difference in color. They appeared to be slight variation in the color. I mean, I'm looking at, at the rendering here, if that's what it's called. I'm really struck by how uniform and, if you don't mind my saying, ugly it is, in my opinion. Everyone has a different opinion. I, I, I don't like it at all, but that's not part of the planning board's purview, I guess. <laughs> that's um, this side of it. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. well, speaking of opinions, I hate to say this, but this reminds me of the Borowski house on Elm Street, where, that, where they bricked in the yeah. porch and caused the whole um, yeah. Elm Street district to come about. Um, because when you get bricks that vary a lot in color, it, it really, I think, looks pretty tacky. And this is going in that direction. And it's, um, if, it was, if it was a matter of like, the variation between the textures, that's a very slight color variation, but, but that is a very big color variation, and it reminds me of the of the um, the multicolored brick. I think, right? That I think that I think was a different scenario because that was just it did not match in any way the existing brick of the house. This is this is right. all. Well, this is this reminds me of that. I yeah, I, can well, see that. I think your your sample does you a disservice because it it really. Uh, points out what, what Joe's talking about here. But I think with the, the basic colors here, it's not going to be as egregious. As no, no, it's, this this reddish color is... Yeah, I, I would not have brought that piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> are the, so we'll put that away. Are the bricks, as it were, are they that size? Is this material, or is it long? It's long. It's long, that's what I thought. They're, they're, so they're not brick-like. They're yeah. different than brick. They're six so feet is, long and like planks. Is each yeah. one of these things, so you're going to assemble, are these like 12 feet long or eight six, feet? Six feet long. Six feet long. So within each one of these six feet long pieces, are they consistent in color? They're like, mm. they, these are the in two. color, yes. In texture, there's some variety, which affects That's how small. colorful they appear. Or it, affects, it adds the variation. These are the colors right here. These are the only two colors that come in. And this is the lighter version. The photo is deceiving because it shows each piece that's a modulation in the color in each individual piece. And what you're saying is that each individual piece is a consistent color, but the texture exactly. may vary a little bit. Right. It has to do with the technology of printing that photograph. Right. Yeah. And that's basically the range that you're going to see. And you're correct. Each piece will have a consistent so if, match. If, I'm, if the variation is going to be as much as it is on those two pieces, I'm not going to have any problem with it at all. Yeah. If the variation is going to be as much as it is on that photograph, right. I am going to have a problem with it. <laughs> now, this, yeah, these, uh, this is why we're bringing the, the samples that we've got, is to show that. But uh, Well, I, I guess I'd like to say that I, I think it's a very thoughtful design. I appreciate how much time you spent thinking about the history of Northampton and trying to blend in um, historical features with modern features. Um, there are a few things that I uh, would like to see perhaps thought a little more about. Um, the prominence of that front facade is great. I'm a little bit concerned that the facades that step back from it are actually taller 
And while that's a good view where it almost appears like it's the same height, when you look at it in elevation and, and certain views from the side, it appears that the pieces that are behind the prominent facade are bigger. Um, they, they are slightly taller. But by a matter of three feet out of 60, so it's 60 yeah. to 63 feet. Um, it just might be one of those things that, you know, the architect walking down the street notices and nobody else does. <laughs> <laughs> um, Fair enough. Like in that elevation, aren't isn't everything at the same maximum height except for the uh, elevator uh, house? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't bother me because that's behind. But that the sort of the first right fin is taller, and I think on the yeah. other side, the the other fin is slightly taller. Yeah, you see. And you kind of want the cornice to be something that really sits on top. The right. That really wants to be the top element, gotcha. and you yeah. you've just snuck the other things up above it, which makes architects go or at least this one gets a little I'm also attention. curious about the mast that you show there is it a flagpole or is it just a decorative element yes yes and yes Peter intends a flag so yes it's a flagpole okay. um, could you talk a little bit more about that facade that was another piece that I was a little bit concerned about that it's so blank in comparison even though it is stepped back um, you said that there might be some art there and I might feel better if I knew what was going to be on that face. We can tell you what you have. <laughs> so actually, that brings up a good point. This is where it's going to act design because Hat is going to spend a year fundraising. We wanted to get in front of you folks, get issues out early, and get them in the cost estimate so that they can confidently fundraise after. So we're at a schematic design level, and we don't have things resolved to a level that I think you're used to seeing. And I'm afraid it's going to be a bit before we can give you that kind of specific detail. You know, I have an issue with actually doing uh, a design or a mural on that. I think it's kind of like you're trying to like decorate architecture. And you know, you got a really strong building there and you don't know what the art's going to be and it's something you're stuck with for a very long time. You know, I could see it being something like the Smith art uh, facade where they have banners that are can mm -hmm. be changed. Yep. But to have a permanent installation on there, I think depending on the politics or the look of it, you know, you're, you're imposing an image on people. And Did I, you get him to say that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we've I'm actually talked about back, But I, I do think, yeah. you know, like, mirrors have their places, but a lot of times they're on facades or in alleyways where yeah. things were not in your face. Yeah. And I think it's an issue. Well, that's a good point in terms of the changeability or impermanence of it. Um, right. It's envisioned that HAP would have a presence on the selection committee and that there'd be a theme about the rail trail and the river and so on. So it's an informed piece of art, but you're right. There isn't absolute control over it. And maintenance of that as well. It's not mm -hmm. like that is something that's permanent, perhaps. Right. And but, yeah. but a blank wall is permanent. <laughs> yeah. Which facade are you talking about the art? Is it this one facing Pleasant Street yeah. or the one facing yeah. south on the no, it's right there. Right, right there. there. Yeah, it's it's right <coughs> it cries for the banner type treatment, right. temporary, mm -hmm. uh, not permanent. But it, it, if we could take a look at the um, uh, bike trail elevation again. The south one or the end one? Yeah. South, yeah. yeah, this south. One. yeah uh, I have a problem with the, um, uh, not with the differentiation, the different colors and all of that. Uh, I think that the, the various elements are too plain. And I would prefer seeing it across the top, maybe introducing the darker color uh, to create sort of a masonry effect cornice line. So right, right, right across the there. Yeah. yeah. Just to terminate that, because you've got the, the blank building, but mm -hmm. there's no um, um, yeah. differential detailing that would separate, or separation of detailing is the kind. So almost an element like this that I'm pointing at across the top. Yeah, in other words, I, I would just run maybe a couple of courses of the mm -hmm. dark along those lighter panels, uh, walls, just to give it a cap. Yeah, well, and that's, that, that, cap on the queen. that relates to how we're handling, I mean, down here yeah, we've got exactly the base the element. Same thing down there. Mm -hmm. And we're actually spacing those a little wider so it has a bit of the rustication, so that can I, can I, I'm sorry, there's one person who's been in the audience that would really like to say something. I actually sit on that side of the table also. Oh, okay. Um, can you go back to the rendering where it showed from the south as you're approaching on Pleasant Street and you see that whole corner of the building? Sure. The rendering or the model? Or actually, in the uh, SketchUp model. 
Um, my my comment on this is that, to me, this is a major gateway to Northampton. And we have two very big blank walls. And the, the, the hope of future public art there, to me, is not enough. That we really need to do something to celebrate the entrance to Northampton via more uh, differentiation in those facades. Um, As per perhaps additional windows, is that kind of what? Yes. Yeah. yeah something to make it look more like the rest of downtown as opposed to being blank. Um, then the other comment I have, which is actually the planning board side of the thing, is um, um, I was kind of hoping for larger street trees because that um, Pleasant Street in general is kind of losing its street trees as time goes by. And, mm -hmm. and those are fairly small there in front. And I was kind of hoping for some more street trees on Pleasant Street. And how, how big will these get, uh, Naomi, roughly? I mean, they well, will be remain small? No, they're, I mean, they're birches. They will get, they will get big. Oh, I thought you said they were M-like here. No, well, the ones on the, on the other side. That's these little, little ones over here. Um, that steps back, those would be the M-like here, or the shad, or the um, <coughs> red bud. Okay. What, what size will they be when planted? Or is that too much of a detail for you to come into? Um, um, I mean, I think hoping 18, 20 feet. Then my, my last comment would be that I'm a little nervous about the entry uh, walk <coughs> clauses, if you will, only in that because of the split in elevation, I'm afraid it's going to end up like the sidewalk across the street from Fitzwillie's, where it's actually split into mm -hmm. unmanageable pieces, as opposed to what you're, you're presenting to us, which would yeah. be a larger plaza entry space. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we've been sensitive to that, at least in terms of the comfort of the place as you sit in it, as well as the ease with which you navigate through it. How wide is the sidewalk that's shown with the two people on it? It's about seven feet there. It's currently three feet of brick and three feet of pavement. So we've taken the brick out and added a foot. So it's seven feet wide, as illustrated. And this, which is part of the reason why we've pushed the building back so we have more breadth of space at the front, because the sidewalk's very narrow there. Mm -hmm. How really large don't. is the like the corridor between the the sitting wall and the s facade? That that wall. Is that that's in your? Let's just go ahead to that. I think we've got some the section diagrams. By the way, these section diagrams that we're showing right. Oops, did I miss it? Um, sorry. Um, they're in your package that we we've handed out. They were submitted, I think, a couple. Yeah, they're in the package right now. There we go. Street level sidewalk is much larger than the corridor right in front of the Yeah. Yeah, it varies. And some of it is planting alongside, some of it is the plaza going back to the city. So, can you repeat that? So, it's seven feet between the where the granite wall would be, or the sections of granite between the granite and. The curb? Um, I think probably a better way to put it is that it's at least seven feet. If you take that seven feet of concrete sidewalk, that would continue all the way through or get wider. There are places where it reaches back still further to the <laughs> granite wall and the steps up to the next walk. Did I just so, so it's it it yeah. So this section in here is the seven feet, and then we have a, this is a, a five foot space in here and then we've got the space for planting and the retaining wall is that correct mm -hmm. we're doing that 14 to i need so to look in, at i need to look mind, at the plan fairly tight and i'm not sure they really qualify for the plaza um, description i'm just worried about a the seven feet um, is the existing sidewalk because when you walk down there now uh, for the most part so it's really all we're going to have is a sidewalk and then some planning, but in the doorway area, widened out just to get into the door, which is no different than a sidewalk going the door. So I think we were thinking that this, with its open corner, and then this, with its open corner, the bike, the bike racks, and then along in here, that this was more of the open area, and it starts to get tighter down here in the, you know, as you come in through here to to signify this residential entry. I mean, this is still a pretty broad opening here, and this is where the um, handicap accessible path through here also then comes out to land on this larger brick area. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I, I would, I would agree with you that, th that this section in here where it is broken up with walk, wall, and walk 
is not is not plaza, but I do feel like this area and this area have have that that feel. Are there any benches okay. in the front there between the building facade and the street? Yes. Uh, the the granite. walls. The granite walls. Oh, the granite walls. Granite walls. Okay. So if you look at the uh, just to give you a, a point of reference, this so this part right here is wider than the existing sidewalk, and then we get a little more breadth in. It's kind of hard to do this without shaking a bit, but a little more. Uh, physical width where the planting is the seating wall and then five feet so it's it's going to be um, it's it doesn't set back quite as far as the existing building uh, the existing uh, Hampton courts which right. I think is yeah. 18 feet or something right. like that the only, the only thing I might suggest is that uh, for planning board members is when you walk down the sidewalk um, people tend to walk on the concrete part and the brick part is where the trees are and if you notice on here You've got, we're walking on the edge of the curb um, and the trees are reversed and then when you get to the other end you have to swap out and go back to the normal Northampton sidewalk layout. I was actually going to ask, did you look at that option of putting the, the planting bed along the street and having the two hard surfaces next to each other which might make it feel more like a larger hard surface even though there's an elevation difference? Just, it is a very busy street and it mm -hmm. might be nice to buffer pedestrian and vehicle um, but that's not our, our you know, I'm our afraid of that situation Alan, that you're doing what they did across the Fitzwillies because if you have the two hard services next to each other then you have to wind up with a railing there and you you know because of the accessibility mm -hmm. you can have a step there Mm -hmm. So you need a railing. Mm -hmm. So you're taking that larger expanse and breaking it up anyway. Well, the, but you have, if you still have that brick wall, the seating wall there. Oh, I, 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 oh, I see. You, you want to leave the, the wall as a separator. separator. Right. So you essentially want to flip what's concrete right. and what's... I'm just asking if it was something you reviewed and if that was an op. We went through a lot of studies. It's probably <laughs> one of them. But And I, I guess the other option would be to reduce the... Uh, which we did talk about was perhaps the the grass or the uh, the ornamental grass area could be hard pavement with uh, street grates for the trees, which would give which would create a broader walking area. Yeah, there might be a way of doing it that better maintained the sort of urban. Do you have a plan view of the existing conditions to get the mm -hmm. the vernacular before and after of the sidewalk? I, I press that. Oh, sorry. So let's see, do I get it? Yes. The existing, there's a little bump right here for a bus stop. And then that six feet is both a three foot brick area and a three foot concrete area. Right, with, with, a, with a, a, a railroad tie retaining wall on the left. Yeah, on so it's, it's quite narrow. Uh, that's par okay. part of the reason why it feels so treacherous walking in that area because it's six feet wide and you're bounded by parking and uh, a railroad tie retaining wall. You had a photo of that, didn't you, on the yeah. presentation? Yeah. Actually, we have a bunch of photos in the back of this. Can I go to those? So there, yeah. there you can see the retaining so wall. There's that retaining wall. And so there's six feet of sidewalk right in here between the curb and that retaining wall. So part of what we're trying to do, obviously, we're getting rid of the retaining wall, creating a planting zone that adds another about four feet or five feet. This is actually a great photograph to illustrate what we were just talking about. For instance, that light pole that's right there, mm -hmm. those bases are a couple feet around and they're right out next to the street. And so yep. what you now have is a sidewalk that's out there. Is it easy to, uh, one of the issues in Northampton for many people is trying to negotiate around street signs mm -hmm. and the, the lights in many cases because the sidewalks aren't wide enough. And I'm just wondering if we're recreating that situation here. So in your mind, creating an even wider sidewalk addresses some of those issues. Mm -hmm. well, to the extent it. that we push the building back further or to the extent we narrow up well, the yeah, plantings in front? Um, I think the streetscape is really important, put yep. it that way. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I would look forward to uh, maybe... Say here, Rick, so for instance, the trees here, as you move north, the trees are on the right, the sidewalk's on the left. Correct. Oh. And then when so yeah. it comes south, you'd have to... You would, it would flop. It. Yeah. You're saying yeah. keep it the same. Well, I'm not saying the street is very necessarily the same. I think there's other options. For, like perhaps maybe the whole thing is paved with tree grates and things like that. But um, I'm worried about okay. ending up too narrow with the lights and the, and the uh, parking signs and the meters and everything else there. That it's going to be 
um, hard to get around and, and not this really fulfilling what we'd like to get in a fresh design. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's good to consider continuity of streetscape uh, for the uh, areas that are north coming into your site rather than jog over to a different uh, pattern. Uh, you just and I, I don't care for the the grass or the plant materials there. I would rather see trees in uh, you know Nina foundry grades or something like that um, because that creates a little bit more of a walkable surface. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just the maintenance of those small plant planting strips out front is going to be very problematic. And I, I would rather see more of a walkway, but also a sense of continuity when you come south on Pleasant Street that you're not going into a different environment uh, but to have a continuity. Mm -hmm. So this is the neighboring building mm -hmm. and so what they have is they have the here's the the curb yeah. and they actually do have that six foot sidewalk between their trees and the edge so it, where it gets a little funny is they have this this planting area that that kicks Trace. out but they you do there is that this is this is actually what we're proposing is the same idea that the trees are set back from the edge but, but you don't have that much rates. distance between the tree and your building that's right correct right. Yeah, I think a little more hardscape would be okay mm -hmm. any other questions from the board we're actually not on the planning board side of things we haven't actually opened it up to the public yet so Rick, I'll take your comments through the through their side of the table. But I'd like to open it up to the public. But before we do, any other questions from the board? No. Uh, Peter, could you speak a little bit about the lighting, the exterior lighting? I can speak to the bit thought, in the building. Yeah. Yes, um, it's funny you should bring that. We're intending fixtures similar to this. It's a very narrow one or two degree splay vertically that's captured at the cornice line. And then below, unlike in this photograph, it's a more generous, I think 25 or 30 foot, 30 foot, yeah, right, degree splay. And it's all calculated to meet the zoning requirements around lighting and dark sky compliance. In terms of what's on the building, and I don't think we have a slide of what we're intending on the site. I know that it was in the yeah, package. package. Yep. Right. Which is a, a pole mounted fixture. And there's also a, a light distribution plan that came as well in the package a little bit later, which is this document. Mm -hmm. which I think got. So that basically articulates you know, the 15, 7, 3, and 1 foot candle. You want to review where they're located? Yeah. Okay. And so assure me that, that with the parking along the side of your asphalt drive that the fire truck can still be around the back. I, don't, I, I was looking for dimensions for that opening. Okay. Um, well, in some ways, if you'll forgive the pun, I can drive around that issue because we've spoken with the fire department and they don't want to bring their truck back there. <laughs> um, they're going to stay on the street and they would come to the parking lot behind and then they would deploy personnel with hoses along the sides of the building. They don't want to get their vehicles inside there. Um, there's an intent. Comes down. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, there's access from the rail trail. So what we've sized that for are things like FedEx trucks, uh, something to haul the trash away, moving vans for residents, etc. And the parking along that panel is in here. Yeah. Sorry. Open yeah, it's the. Um, the, the e those eco block, the, mm -hmm. the block Those guys in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got uh, in the front of that, between that uh, that car that's closest to the street and the street, you've got a open square concrete area. Tell me what what's going on there. So that's the that's the parklet um, with. And I'll, I'll move to this. There's there are two retaining walls. Right. We have um, then at the neighboring building, the pavement actually slopes up, and so part of um, mitigating the grade here is we're putting using this retaining wall, and we have two steps down, 
into this parklet, the the sidewalk would continue unimpeded by any steps. But then this is a little recessed area with two seat walls, and this is where the, the smaller scale planting is. So a little gathering spot there. But you are looking at smaller scale that planting. The, the proposal was for um, some smaller scale flowering trees in there. Because it does, that has the possibility of softening the view of that adjacent building that you were talking mm -hmm. about when mm -hmm. you come in. So a, a larger tree there mm -hmm. could, could be considered not for the parklet version, but for the up against the other building, which is much more your worries than ours, but we get planting issues. So there is quite a large um, honey locust that right that's on this corner mm -hmm. right now um, that you can see. Yeah, I did see it in the other one. Yeah. And it is the one that's back in line with the others that you'll... It's about right where I have the little hand of this cursor, uh -huh. sort of off screen, but it's back from the edge of the sidewalk, floating in the middle of that, of that um, the entry plaza there. Okay. Um, staying with this uh, plan view, how visible are the dumpsters going to be? I have visions of the dumpsters at the Smith College Student Center, which you know, from Elm Street weren't terribly well received. Yeah. Are, sorry, I'm going to the wrong. You don't have that elevation. No, I don't have that. Because oh, in plan view, they look. Are they screen? Yes. yes. They are screen. Yeah. So. It's right in there. Yep. So that's a that's a, a fence or that's a screening of some sort. Mm -hmm. Very similar to the material on the building. Okay. Same slat, separated. Okay. And it sits in front of the dumpsters. Around. Yeah. So it's all sides. And than so how do they enter the dumpsters? They swing. So it's the gate. Oh, it's a gate? Yeah. yeah. Oh, with the wood material from the back. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if there's still a question about the lighting, but I can point on, on the plan where they're going to be. We have the, um, we just have five fixtures, and there are two that are along this um, parking edge, and then there are two um, along this path, and then one along in this um, entry area on the side. And let me sort of clarify to some degree that the ones up here have asymmetric throw, so they, they sort of have house side cutoffs <coughs> to block anything going off the property. Same thing down in this area, but the two out in here have more of a uniform pool effect. So there, there are some issues brought up by planning board staff regarding the lighting. You've seen those, don't have any issues with those? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, in terms of the wattage of the... Right. Yes, right. Okay. no problem with that. In fact, we would no, put in there, but she got... I'm not familiar with that one site, but the upper left-hand corner there where the walk path goes through that green area, are those trees? Is that a very dense area? So there are existing very, very large and... and tall um, honey locusts that are, that are quite limbed up. Um, and, and so there, it's a mature grove that we want to accentuate and, and add to. But um, currently, there is a, a path that yep. walks through there, cut through sort of to back to, the, um, to Main Street. And it's quite easy to walk under them. Yeah, it's my easy. only my input was that you mentioned two lights bordering the <coughs> grass area mm -hmm. on yeah. that path. Mm -hmm. But is there a security, you know, a security issue of going into that darker area at night? I mean, it, since it's on your property, don't you think that should be illuminated further in on the Well, actually, the there's a fixture intended here that has a big butterfly splay, so part of it reaches all the way out into here without spilling over onto the adjacent property. Okay. And then, of course, the other part of it goes this way. Unfortunately, aren't there lights in the parking lot? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Alani, are you okay with us opening up to the public? Any other questions by the board? Any other questions over here? Okay, so we're going to open this up to public comment. If uh, anyone out there wants to speak, uh, if you could raise your hand, I'll call you. You can come up to the podium and just give us your name and address, and we'll take it from there. Yep, come on up. I just had a couple of questions. Um, I, I really like the front straight facade. <laughs> For the record, Tom Douglas. Oh, Tom Douglas, sorry. Um, it's 
so I think the front of the building is really successful. And I came in a little bit late, so I might have missed it. But the, the, the screen wall, the big wall that you're talking about that has art on it, mm -hmm. um, I didn't, does that stick out completely? Um, this, it's a freestanding tall wall that you walk under. Is that what it is? I didn't fully understand. Well, it's so, part of but let me, I have just had two questions. That, could you further explain it? And also, there's got to be a bus stop along there somewhere. Yep. So I didn't, Correct. I didn't catch that either. I don't know if that's going to get relocated or not. But yes, there is one there. And the intention is for that use to still remain. Probably in another location. That's just the end wall of that. Oh, OK, I see. Yeah. But I, I, I do agree with the comment that a cornice along the, the, the rest of the building that isn't still in keeping with the front of the building, I think would be a nice addition to cap it off and make it less. Uh, I mean, it's, it's modern, but it's you I don't think modern in a good way. And you can do a modern cornice that would help blend it into the rest of the yard. Okay. Anyone else? Are we still allowed to make comments? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. 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 I, I, could you go over to the other side, the wind wall on the other side, the smaller wind wall? <laughs> yeah, well, that, that wall completely is freestanding. It doesn't, the, build, the rear portion is set back. Is that correct? Oh, I see. It's a tri it's, yeah. That's where the stairwells are. Can you go up a little bit? Uh, yeah, I see. Uh, okay. You can see there's a stairwell in that. Yep. Yeah. yeah. At the it, end of the corridor. You can see there how much the, the the wing wall does come above the facade, and this is what you were talking about with bringing that down. Yeah. Well, and I think the whole every, the several comments about continuing the cornice. So, I mean, yes, I, I understand sort of the idea of the fractured fins and <coughs> but something that pulls the whole thing together. Yeah, we do have that feature in the back. Yeah. It's just, you know, the, the continuous, that small wing wall versus the large wing wall inside. I think you understand this, and maybe it was your intent, but to me, it makes the, the building kind of look like a base relief. Like it's kind of like stuck on a painting or on a wall. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. it gives the appearance that this facade is just, you know, plugged so on there. You're speaking particularly of this? That wall. Yeah, I yeah. Think, yeah, because the other one has more mass and, it and does. articulation with the lines and the flagpole on. Yeah, but some, on. some of what we're doing also is that we're lacing together, like, you know, lacing your fingers together, some of the brick as it goes to the back and some of the other material coming forward. Right. And here, you have none of that. It just transitions. You know, or it does. The other. Or it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so they have a nice little dialogue here, but we're still figuring it out. Yeah. <laughs> It's a good point. Yeah, it's, okay. it's an anomaly to me to the rest of the building. Uh, it's just Thank you. too plain. <laughs> yep. Can you just Thanks. clarify too? It looks like you're proposing gray on the interior courtyard as opposed to yellow. Oh. Um, or is that? Well, we're intending a beige buff color that, at least at the moment, Echoes the oh, okay. brick color on on the clapboards. Yeah, and I apologize, it's not rendering that way on the screen. Our friend technology. Uh, any other questions from the public? We can leave the public comment open for a little bit as we talk before we close it. Any other questions from the board? I'm just not sure if, it, if I remember what the response was to Rick. It's Rick, right? Um, about the large blank space as you enter Northampton on coming from South Pleasant Street. I understand that art is the desired outcome, but that seems to be somewhat uncertain. I, I actually think both walls are, are yeah, relatively so blank. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's a big space with a lot of with more blank than not. Yeah, I think part of what Rick's responding to is how, you know, as a gateway, you know, that's part of this edge, urban edge. It has a strong presence as you come up Pleasant Street, vehicularly, and as you come up the railroad tracks in a train. So how those appear is kind of 
um, one of the first impressions, mm -hmm. the fair way of describing. Mm -hmm. And you know, the hope is that eventually there is something there that is of more interest that announces Northampton as an arts community in a way that isn't explicit, you know, great big ART. Mm -hmm. Kind of like on the um, railroad bridge where there's various aspects. Is there some reason that you didn't put a second row of windows inside the first one? Um, yeah. <laughs> there are bathrooms in here. But we could do something that carried that vocabulary like across. It right. it, like it wants to have windows. There. So you're, you're talking about in this right. stack yeah. right here. Right. Yep. This is in the corridor. So there's daylight that comes inside. And then there's an apartment here, and there's an apartment here. The main window's facing this way. That's the laundry area. So you're talking about a stack of windows, right? It just mm -hmm. wants to have windows. OK. And would you say the same of this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Except it's not quite as prominent. So we can compromise on one side, not the other? <laughs> <laughs> Upper floor, lower floor? <laughs> By the way, my, having made a critical comment about the side of the building, I just want to say I think the front looks really nice. Thank you. But it needs those um, So I just want to throw out there, so in terms of process, I mean, you guys have very different jurisdictions. I don't know if, if um, Central Business wants to have more discussion about how you hash out these details, if you feel like you want to see other plans you know, maybe about the windows before you make any kind of decision. So there, there are a couple of options. Either you both can um, hash out your permitting, you know, paths together, or um, we can, y you can adjourn and go upstairs to the second floor of City Hall and continue your meeting there. Wayne um, Fiden is here, so he can go up and you know, be staff presence there for you if you want to do that, or I know that splits the applicant a little bit, but y you know, it, yeah, we're it's to up to mm -hmm. you know you guys. Let me uh, let me ask how how much of a um, hardship it would be, and I know this is pretty far in the future anyway. How much of a hardship it would be to have another hearing where you come back with that to show us what your um, um, cornice would look like and any potential changes in the windows or the... It, I guess let me, can I ask Carolyn a question in respect to that? Because this is, as Peter said, this is schematic design so that they can get through the permitting process so the building, so the HAP can raise money mm -hmm. and, and get funding. Um, so since it's not a fully developed design, which is what we're used to seeing, can we issue a permit with a condition that prior to the building permit being pulled, they come back and show any revisions and updates or clarifications to the design? Um, you could do that. I would suggest if you were going to do that, more specificity. You know, if you want to see windows and you want to see the cornice wrapping, specify, you know, before a permit is requested that they need an amendment from you all as it relates to those elements that you want to see adjusted as opposed to just saying show us your final design I mean it sounds like you have some interest in directing some modifications so I guess I would you know, phrase it in that context but yes it's possible for, to give a condition for it. let me um, let me say I'm um, uh, first of all I, would, I want to compliment you on this thing I, this is going to be a huge um, and very positive addition to Pleasant Street. I, I, I really think you've done a very fine job with it. As far as I'm concerned, um, I would be willing to vote to grant the credit uh, and to, to the permit based on what's here. And um, if you decided that you wanted to take some of the suggestions, you could come back before us and, and have another hearing. But if other if others of us feel that we have to see a change of design first, then that's then maybe we should um, uh, have a second hearing when when the design has been more finalized. But you're um, I, you should you should know that you, the direction you're going in is going to win an approval. I, I Thank you very much.
Yeah, well, I would I, agree with Joe that this is almost treating this like a uh, pre preliminary design review uh, and sort of uh, you know taking a look at the concept and saying you guys are aimed in the right direction. Here are some of our thoughts. You've come back with some feedback on that. But we, we definitely don't have a, a final document, a final design. Uh, and you would be going back and uh, you know refining this. But I think conceptually, uh, you're headed in a very good direction. I'm very excited about the project. I agree with Joe. This will be a, a huge addition to uh, that part of Pleasant Street. Uh, there are some details here, um, and I think that um, you know if we could say this is sort of a preliminary review, you've got our thoughts, you've got uh, your marching orders, so to speak. Uh, is that? And then, no, I, I think that the issue is that they need a permit in order to move forward. With well, so could I ask you that? I mean, is our approval uh, prohibit fundraising or whatever is necessary so for this to. project? I mean, if the mm -hmm. planning board passes their part of it to allow that to go forward, would it be an inconvenience to come back to us with just the final details? Well, there are actually two aspects here, one of which is they have to compete for funding. So the more permits we have in place, the more well, you can probably speak to that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, Peter, was, Peter was right on about that. <clears throat> I mean, you know, as we approach uh, state funding sources and, and, and others that are needed for the low-income housing tax credits and the state soft debt and so forth, to the extent that we have uh, planning board approval and CBAC approval, uh, even if it means coming back to fine-tune the details, uh, that sets us in better stead with the uh, funding sources that we need. So I would encourage going in that direction. Uh, you know, to, to be able to represent to the state that we've got the approvals in hand, coming back for the fine tune of the details doesn't present an issue. Well, on, on, on our end, I think from the planning board sense, we have enough information to, even with conditions, to finalize our end of it tonight. Do you need more time, as Carolyn said, to I, excuse yourselves to come up with those specific items that you want to uh, attach as conditions to the permit? or? Well, let me propose to the board. I think the the three things that I saw from the the comments was um, resolution of the blank walls, uh, the two primary, the south and uh, I guess that would be southeast blank wall, resolution of the cornice, both the height of the primary one and then cornice wrapping around the entire building, and um, a little more clarification on the on the materials in the courtyard at least how you would see them from the street. The materials in the landscape or materials <laughs> on the building? Okay. So I guess what, what in principle you're saying we would... I, we I guess would I would approve it with the condition with that, those conditions, that right. they come back uh -huh. and show us resolution on those details. That would be great. Prior to... The so um, the cornice, the blank uh, walls, and what about the window, and including potentially windows mm -hmm. on the... Potentially additional yeah. windows. Both, both blank no, walls, hot. the south. And I, I don't, I don't know that the blank walls have to have windows in them. I think that they need to have some articulation. Some articulation. Um, should, so I don't want to direct that they have to put windows. Should in. we close the public hearing before we make a motion? Not necessarily. I mean, it depends on whether you. I mean, yes, before you make a motion, you should close the public hearing. But it, you know, while you're in this discussion, you could certainly keep it open. So. Um, how does the board feel about making that sort of? Proposal? Well, I'll make. I'll. I'll, I'll think so. Mm -hmm. And we can come up with a motion that does that. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess then can we can we close the public hearing and make a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Does anyone want to try to craft that? Or should I craft it? <laughs> Maybe you should. I, <laughs> I would. I would move that we give a conditional approval to this project. Um, with a condition that um, uh, the applicant come back for us and address the issues. Um, one, a cornice going around the top of the building. Two, um, window treatment on and articulation on blank walls. Three, um, the height of the blank walls being above the level of the cornice. And four, the material on the courtyard side of the building because we don't like the Text. the, gra the mm -hmm. um, grained um, material that's shown there. Is that 
Can I second? I would second that. All, all in favor? Okay. And I guess uh, so for that we we are officially can I get a motion can we adjourn you can oh, don't are, are we supposed to oh, move up yeah, to the you want to adjourn adjourn to upstairs you have that informal okay. discussion we will right. adjourn we'll to upstairs <laughs> okay so planning board uh, is still open while um, the architectural board is is heading out I want to go to Peter Peter's still there um, <laughs> So public comments still open. You received the comments from the staff. I just want to go over them with you before we make them conditions. Uh, I just want to make sure you're aware of them. Mark, in terms of the landscaping configuration on the front, is that under our jurisdiction? Permit, so everything is fair game. Okay. Especially as it relates to trying to, they're asking that special permit for the Oh, the setback. bigger setback right. for right. the purposes of creating a plaza, so it absolutely is within right. the jurisdiction. Okay. To that includes the, uh, the walkway, yep. the yep. walkway yep. issue. Right. And I also, there were a couple of com additional comments from DPW that I got this afternoon that, you know, All right, so maybe I'll go through these and then you can, and you can yeah. hit those. Too much. So, Peter. Too much. Peter. Good print. I can tell you've been before this. <laughs> Peter? I know, I know. <laughs> so, Peter, I want to go over the, I, I understand you've received the comments from the staff. I just want to go over them with you before we make them a condition as far as approving our permit. Let me just hit these, and if you have any questions. Great, because I'm not sure that we're talking about the same set of comments. That's why I want to make Thank sure. Thank you. First up, two weeks prior to the building permit, construction docs reviewed and approved by the DPW, showing final conditions of stormwater pipes, invert steps for infiltration basins, and leaching catch basins. This would be before uh, construction a permit? Yes. Yeah. Two, dumpster pad pitch toward driveway to drain uh, manhole number three. Yep. Three, front sidewalk pitch toward north or south to prevent ponding in front of the seating area. I think it pitches east. It does. As long as it doesn't pond. It won't pond. It pitches, it pitches towards the street. Okay. Uh, Prior to building permit, video, conf video confirmation of condition of storm drain manhole from uh, drain manhole number three to city drain must be performed. Any upgrade, repair, replacement to ensure function of drainage from site must be done. Uh, city pays for it? It doesn't say that here. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all lights must be color temp of 3,000 K or less. Wall lights intended to wash the facade must be directed so that the illumination is cut off by the roof eaves. Illumination shall be cut off no further from the building than the midpoint of the eave. No further than, so you're talking about horizontally from the face of the facade going towards the street. Correct. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Wall lights shall be shown, uh, uh, shall be as shown on the spec sheet, duo metal halide with no greater than 1% uplighting for wall wash. The reality is, in a couple of years, those are probably going to be LEDs, just because of how the technology is changing. But it would have the same photometrics. Okay. In other words, basically, this is for dark sky compliance, right? right. Yeah. So but it's just the reason why it says a metal halide is because that that's specified in your application. Yes. So it's just referencing what you've presented, yep. so that it's clear which light um, yep. permit is addressing. Okay. I don't, it doesn't, you don't have to keep, maintain a metal, metal halide light. And we have no problem with that. Wall light shall not exceed 39 watt bulb as shown in the options. Yep, we can do that. <clears throat> if the city pulls the retaining wall back from the Pleasant Street sidewalk at the rail trail, rail trail entrance, the applicant will modify the entry plaza path to the residential entrance substantially consistent with the plan sheet L2.02 landscape concept alternate. alternate, the alternate yep. yep. Right. And in deference to the fundraising and so forth and the time scale, uh, we, the permit would be granted with a condition with a three-year construction timeline instead of a standard two-year because, you know, to bump it out because you're at the early stages in schematic phase. Appreciate that. Can we come back to you, such as the prior applicant, to extend that if we need to? Yes, but I would recommend that 
um, unlike the prior applicant, to get here. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on that one, too. Um, and so DPW had some other? I mean, you could even say now, four years or whatever you, you feel you're mm -hmm. comfortable with. Uh, my recommendation was just we know that it's going to take them a while to fundraise, so it's not like other projects, and it gives them a little flexibility. So it's really right. up to the board to decide, you know, if, and that then would, you know, preclude them having to come back. Um, okay. So. So, DPW. Yeah, so then DPW sent their final comments this afternoon, and a lot of them are about, um, they're actually not that many comments relative to how big the project is. <laughs> but there were three in particular about um, water connections, and, and there was, um, the engineer spoke to one of them about reusing one of the um, sleeves. Um, but I think instead of getting into specificity, if you would just want to put a condition that says that the applicant has to um, um, connect, use um, water line connections in, in um, compliance with DPW standards for um, connecting to the water lines, that'll cover all of those issues that they had concern with. And they talked, um, one of the concerns is switching out the, the water line size and all of that. So um, I think they have the comments. They know what the um, DPW requirements are relative to that. Um, and uh, so <clears throat> I think we already talked about the stormwater. They had um, DPW was concerned about the fact that there wasn't enough soil information to um, understand the infiltration um, allowances that were um, shown on the plan. So um, they want a written report um, for review and approval about you know, the final design and, and soil composition to show that um, the roof runoff can be handled or that the system proposed where there, um, where there might be some infiltration and then um, overflow into the city system works. Um, Can I stop you there just a minute to see if the approval of that would have to come from this board in a hearing, or can we get that so less formally right from DPW in their review? Um, no, you wouldn't have to come mm -hmm. back to the planning board okay, for you. that. Um, so they just want to see the final drainage calculations, basically. Um, and then um, they also want an executed stormwater operations and maintenance plan prior to an issuance of a building permit. Yep. Um, and there's specificity about how that's done. We have a standard for um, what needs to be in that stormwater maintenance. Um, so it's pretty boilerplate. Mm -hmm. uh, and <coughs> Um, they had similar concerns about the um, ponding um, issues with the around the granite wall. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and a question about where the um, there's a six-inch perforated pipe below the back side of the wall, and they had a question about where that drains, where the outlet. We can provide that. But the board might want to know that too, because if it's going into the public sidewalk, that could be an issue with right. we would, freezing. We would tie it into the we would tie it into the storm drain system. It's just a and and we may not actually even need that drain because it is um, it was just to alleviate any hydrostatic pressure behind that wall. But it, since it's all paved up above it, we may not actually need it when we when we do our final calculations. But if you did need it, it would be tied into. It would be the tied into the into the storm drain system. Mm -hmm. So um, the, you might want to just consider site, conditions that street, that you know yeah. any drainage pipes side. on the just front sidewalk have to be tied in to the. So storm drain. I just clarified that that connection to the storm drain system would be first onto our site and then part of the whole property connection to the city, not another Not connection directly. to this right, right right that makes okay. sense <laughs> okay um and then i just want to so then i think the board probably needs to discuss more about that sidewalk in the plaza area and you know the issue about dimensions and and also finally sort of rebuilding that public portion of the sidewalk to make sure it blends in with the entire plaza area so you don't have you know any kind of issue with um, you know not matching up and creating 
um, a disconnect, you know, between mm -hmm. the existing conditions and what they're proposing, which is many times a requirement when projects come forward, you have to rebuild the portion of the public walk in front of the building. All right. Carolyn, um, it says if the city pulls the retaining wall, um, which presumes that there's been some thought about the city, what's the issue there? So um, we applied for this MassWorks grant on Pleasant Street that would address um, a whole host of things, but mostly pedestrian um, connections and crosswalks and um, green infrastructure, green um, drainage along from um, Strong Avenue south all the way down to Holyoke Street, um, Hockenham Road. And as part of that application, we um, looked at um, creating a, so here's the um, rail trail connection here, and there's a tall retaining wall here, sort of boxes in and makes it, makes um, site um, really complicated and difficult when you're coming down the bike path. You don't know who's coming. So part of the um, uh, grant was to look at pulling this back mm -hmm. to here maybe, you know, whatever the, the air part is, and having this more of a gradual open sort of area so it's much more um, um, friendly in terms of safety and also visibility there. And um, if that happens, we want to make a coordinated sort of transition zone between public and private space there. And we didn't get the grant, but um, we're going to pr par probably, we think, because it wasn't, um, these grants are granted if you have a construction ready project. And it wasn't construction ready because we had a lot of design that we, you know, details that we had to work out. So we're actually going to, um, move ahead on getting the design piece of it done so that next year's cycle will be more construction ready than we are this year and maybe more successful at getting the Correct. grant. Okay. Um, the public comment portion is still actually open. Is there anyone in the public who wants to speak? Yeah. Motion to move. I move to close. Move to close. Second. Second. Tests rather. Um, all in favor? All right, so public portion is closed. We've got uh, conditions from staff and DPW. Um, do we want to talk any more about the sidewalk slash plaza in the front? The only, and I am loath to suggest getting rid of trees, but I mean, especially now that uh, this particular view, there's a lot happening. <laughs> in that kind of, you know, section of sidewalk. And I, I guess I am now, I realize that the, if just above that, the trees actually sit back, but you've got a much wider total space, if I'm remembering correctly. Is that so build is, set back for Right, the building is back here. This is all concrete. Right, but the trees are. Concrete. And the trees are in, are sort of right along in street, here. Right? The, yeah. All right. And so the, you can see here how this is drawn, that this is the three-foot brick section of right. the sidewalk, and then there's the three-foot concrete section. And we have taken, again, and matched that all along the front. Right. Actually, a little bit broader. And this is just a, this is our concrete um, score joint coming through here, and then we're making that entry to the driveway rather than the asphalt coming all the way through. We were carrying that over and then along up through here. Um, you might be able to see it better on this. Hmm. Um, so this is the... Except that the public hearing's closed. Right. So, but if you're adding information for us, then that's fine. So, I mean, if, Sorry. if we need the information... For yeah. The, but right. What, what makes it hard, too, is the elevation change. Right. That's, itself. yeah. Is, is, it's not like it's a building in the front uh, or north where it's all one level. Right. Yeah. There's, a, yeah, like, you know, there's just a lot. And, and, you know, not unlike over by, you know, across from Fitzwillies where you have right. this kind of, you know... It, I don't know if it's quite as big as that, but I, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, for some reason, I almost want to think about, well, would it be better, I hate to say this, without the trees and it just kind of a clean surface? I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I actually am not bothered at all by the trees away from the road there. I mean, I think they're, they're trees over a seated, you know, sitting area. They, um, 
they I think they break up the that you know mm -hmm. idea of just putting trees right along the, the street all the way down and I so I'm just really not bothered by it I want the sidewalk wide enough what mm -hmm. about with the with the um, instead of having greenery in there the um, what are the grades with the drains yeah. which you can walk on actually right. um, and uh, but leaving them on the in on the in interior rather than exterior as a compromise I'd assume that's what they were no, it's, see, they're sitting no, it's in grass. greenery. Yeah. yeah, there's grass. There's strips of um, grass. Yeah, um, uh, so it's all like in grass. So. Uh, so that would make them like the ones next to it, if, if, if something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh -huh. So in other places on the city sidewalks where we have trees that in are In the great. great. Right. And, and realistically, when you have little patches of grass like that, they're Dogs gonna, put they're never going to look like they do in this. Yeah, they're going to. Yeah, they. No, no. In fact, I, my favorite are to get the recessed. You know, with the with the mm -hmm. little border fence to keep people from tripping into it. But I've seen some really nice treatments of tree boxes. Been new construction I saw in D.C. at the Navy Yard did a great job of all of that. But I I don't I don't feel strong enough so, about it. I just wanted to say I'm not bothered. Yeah. About it. Mm -hmm. Well, the grates you can walk right over. Oh, yeah. yeah, right. That's the point. Yeah, maybe that's yeah. It's not can as much. Ask what the architects think of that? Why, if there was a reason that it wasn't done that way, not allowed to? Reason can you whisper? <laughs> <laughs> so, is the orientation of the trees not an issue? It's just the, yeah. It, it's more just, just yeah, the, the grass. I mean, this grass. Yeah, it was just yeah. It was right. just there was all. You know, it wasn't the, not the trees that were there. It was just maybe going to the other to the grate like type treatment instead of the. The, trying to fit in grass and trees. I do, th and I do think, though, there is some benefit to the trees. I mean, being closer to the street and having the pedestrians walk behind them, so they're not walking right on the street. It's, I think, a little safer and uh, has a better feel to it. Um, and that way, also, I believe the sidewalk where you are walking would be quite a bit wider. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it, just a reminder where this is now, you know, I agree with a lot of what's been said, but this is a very, um, you know, active bus stop. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, I walk past this, you know, 12 to 15 times a week and, you know, there's just as many people walking as there are sitting and waiting for the bus. So, you know, I kind of like where the trees are because, you know, you have a lot of curbside activity and, you know, it's kind of, it makes that more accessible. I'm about to say something I can't believe I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. I love the seating. Um, I, I think it's great, uh, particularly in the context of, you know, this schematic where it looks more like it's an office setting. I think there should, we might just be mindful of retailers who maybe aren't as enthusiastic about having open concrete Benches. seating outside of, you know, I'm... I wouldn't be one of those retailers, but from what I've heard from other folks in town, that may be a There's concern. No back, Say again? No back. There's no back to just... True, this is true. <laughs> I, there's no back on the sidewalk either, but you know, there's a lot of folks who camp out. So, you know, again, that's not a personal position, but it's just something to be mindful of in terms of design that if we're talking about, you know, small scale retail versus office use, it just, you know, one thing is, I know you've followed the conversation about the benches, so let's just go ahead and talk about it. But one thing about that that has come up is that if you divide it into seating positions, even with the, on your design, we've talked about doing uh, arm benches that would break it up so it doesn't become a reclining mm -hmm. uh, offer. And in your case, you can do the same thing in breaking up that flat top surface by just edging it with seating, you know, a little raised area that makes it not suitable to sleep on. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there could be some easy consideration to that. I actually really like the benches because it is yeah. the bus stop. It serves the purpose. Mm -hmm. Right. And so. And, but the reason they're there in the first place is because of the grade change. Right. right. They so. Wouldn't, they wouldn't be, they won't exist. They need to exist. Right. Because they're serving a function. And, and then. Plantings couldn't serve as a. A barrier between the grade change could they no you no. need a retaining wall okay. or a bench or a granite or something yeah. so in my view if you're going to have seating because you need to have or you're you're going to have the granite wall which i like because it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it continues the the retaining wall that already exists and kind of brings it around the front 
if that physically needs to be there, I'd rather have the trees next to this this sitting area right. than away right. from you by the street. Right. Our trees right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I'm I'm sense. I'm happy with just the way it is, minus the grass because I don't think that's realistic and it might make that walkway feel yeah. wider. Right. Yeah. If yeah. if it would if be it slightly <laughs> wider, feel more wide. Right. Wider. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. And we don't know if there there will or will not be. A, uh, PBTA hasn't proposed a bus shelter or anything uh, on this stretch, right? So this is effectively the, the new bus stop. Mm -hmm. Any chance for a trash can? <laughs> well, on the public end, they might end up yeah. putting something, but that won't be for the applicant. Yeah. So how do we make that a condition? What did you say? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah, we'll I didn't. Oh, no, I <laughs> So how do we make that? Uh, I think we're saying we want no grass, but with the walking grates, whatever they're called, there must yeah. be a name for them. Tree grates. Tree grates. Yeah. Tree, grates. Tree, tree grates and paving in lieu right. of grass. Mm -hmm. Okay. Retaining the trees. Concrete. Retaining the trees. <laughs> right. Okay. The trees exist well enough in those boxes with the grate. So they don't get that the soil doesn't get compacted. Yeah. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got a bunch of conditions, and I think we're ready. Um, I, Maybe not. <laughs> I, I feel like the elephant in the room needs to come out and get talked about the parking. I mean, I it's it, we should just it, I, I would feel remiss in our responsibility to discussing the project not to have talked about that. So um, you can. I've heard different numbers as the project has developed for the parking that you might have wanted. Seven. Yeah. Oh, pu public yeah. hearing says, well, then we can talk about right. it. <laughs> Darn. Seven right. is the number that's in there when Six, I counted. I no, there's one on the other side. Oh, is there? Yeah, there were seven, the I think. Only shows okay, five. so here's the issue. There's five and then one on the other side. Business district. I also, mm -hmm. there's um, two dozen market rate units. So you can't really tell me there won't be cars associated with these units. So what's going to have to happen is there's going to have to be some sort of warehousing or placing the car somewhere else. And so I, I, I do think it, I mean, I, I don't think this is insurmountable. I think we all want this building, but I, I just think that we ought to, uh, as much concern as there will be about that issue, we ought to talk about what we think we're doing in the central business residential building. Do we have authority to impose parking requirements? No. no. It's it's not required in central business. And in, in they could provide zero. Yeah. And they have in my view, I mean I I have I haven't really said my opinion about the project as a whole. I think it's wonderful. I think it's I think the massing is great, the, the scale, how it presents itself as you come into the town. Um, and I would while I understand the parking issue, I would hate to take part of this building away and replace it with a parking lot. Um, and so I, presumably the applicant has done the homework and they don't think the lack of parking will be an issue for the, for the residents. If it's really good, we'll have zip cars in there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, so I think there will be within a five minute walk, right. there's, yeah. there's all this parking. I mean, yeah. I had the, go ahead. On the other, that's true. On the other hand, I park in the garage Ever, ever since it's been built, five mm -hmm. days a week, mm -hmm. and it gets very crowded at times. Mm -hmm. Sometimes more than other. If you get there past, I don't know, eleven o'clock in the morning, you're parking on the top level, um, mm -hmm. and that's without sidewalk sales and whatever. Of course, now that there's yeah, that's bid, the, that won't be an issue. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> right. I think where I want but, to go with this is I'm not really talking to the building and the applicant. I'm talking yeah, to the city in general. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm saying, I, you know, it's something that if we do this project and the following project, right. and, there's going to have and to we and we redo Pleasant another. Street, right. and, we've and that's got why I think we're in the middle of a parking study, study right. right? That I want that uh, contract process of the parking study to be well informed about what the projects they can't see look like. I think yeah. probably the next one, the, 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 lumber the lumber yard is far enough away from the garage so it won't be so convenient and they may have to provide parking to be marketable. I don't know. 
Well, yeah. and I completely agree. And and I, when this they use this slide and you know and yeah, wow, 1,500 parking spots. That's well, That's geez, that seems like a lot. But I think Alan makes a good point. All of us that live in Northampton and come downtown on any kind of regular basis, there are times when it's hard to find a parking spot. So I mean, so I, there are lots within a five-minute walk, but they're getting filled up and 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 so i you know i do think there you was know, something that we're going to have to think about kind of as a municipality that you know we, we've done a good job of it but you know that it is starting to fill up I, I think we can think about it but not in yeah. this context yeah. because in this context it's not it, right we can't do anything about it what is the timeline if any on the parking study that's being done i i don't know <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> i mean that's the they simplest said answer last night though four four months no wednesday night four months but you know, even uh, I, but that will just that be the study, yeah. right? Not, right. Oh, We've had a lot problem. of studies. We also know that the trend is very much moving in the direction of people who are living downtown are not bringing the same kind of cars as, as historically people have brought to their residential yeah. units. So, um, can we put as a requirement that they only rent to people who don't have cars? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's funny. I was going to go the opposite direction on this project and say. Do we even have to have five parking spaces on here? I mean, I assume you know, that's for staff, or is, whatever, right? But, for half right. staff, well, but you know, to just to not in. have you we know, need to bring things in and get them inside. Yeah. And so I'm willing to back out of this bee's nest and just say I really do like the project a <laughs> yeah. lot, and uh, and I I didn't even have some of the design concerns. I thought you'd thought it through really well, um, and and it's I, I think people are going to be really tickled. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, who wants to tickle me with a motion? <laughs> <laughs> Let me rephrase that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't speak. <laughs> <laughs> what do we have? Just the we have all the DPW. Well, we've, yeah. got, we've got the conditions per staff, the conditions DPW, and the uh, walkway in front. Move that we approve it with the staff, the DPW, and the DPW recommendations, and the requirement that the grass be removed and the tree grates be utilized. Second. 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 Uh, all in favor? Good to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I presume you're continuing to meet? Yes. Yeah. So, do we have two minutes to get our credit out of here, or would you rather we come back later? No, no, you can go. Just go ahead. You can. Okay, um, thanks very much. Anyone who doesn't want their color rendering, can I have a pen? Are you going to draw on parking spots? No, um, they're coming in the CPC. So, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Just the color ones you, you want? The ones? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. You want Thank them all? You. Uh, sure. Are you they, with? They're, they're projects. <laughs> or maybe you don't know the answer, but um, so Lumberyard, is this project and Lumberyard, are they competing for the same low-income housing tax credits? Like, so is there a possibility that so what is this one is going to end up turn Northampton like that? No, I think okay. they have several rounds. So typically, okay. you might so even if they're staggered, you could go to the next one. So it's not like one is going to cannibalize the other. Right. They both. So like Christopher Heights and Bill is the hospital. They they failed on their first attempt. Okay. They got their second attempt. Okay. And now they're moving yeah. forward. Yeah. 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 The yeah. Yeah. Oh, that is on the agenda. It's not on the agenda. They gave us right. the material. Oh, yeah. No. No, 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 that's that's we're not talking about it. Again, we might not have any more questions for a long time. I know. It just happens to come. Is that just. Okay, kids, we're still, we're still live. Um, we've got one more order of business tonight, scheduled for 8 40, so we're almost a full hour behind, uh, to review the amendment to rules governing subdivision of land. Carolyn has a 45-minute slide presentation. <laughs> I don't have as many pretty pictures. <laughs> so I guess the question for you is, 
I can connect to the projector and we can walk through the entire ordinance or I don't know if you have it digitally or printed out and you want me to just walk through from here or what you're we don't have it printed out well I didn't I wasn't anticipating that you might print it out but so I'd be happy to put it on the projection so I'll just move over to the yeah. podium yeah. and do that you're gonna do a summary well, um, I could, I mean, a lot of it I think is, can be summarized because um, it's sort of just updates and text changes, but I think what I could do is do a summary, but then go over more detail of the substance. Yeah. Uh, I have a printed out for now, okay. Oh my goodness, look at that. Whoa. <laughs> it's a printer. Oh, yeah. It's in type, size two type. Yeah. yeah. I did two sheets per page. Yeah. For now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Can you? Yeah. She's the only person. Can I? Can I run and grab? <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> she will be if she starts reading. Wow. <laughs> you don't want to look at no. it. <laughs> Hit a light. Okay. I've gotten some kind of paint you know, gallons, has all the instructions mm -hmm. and directions and stuff in English and Spanish. You gallon can so then if you buy a quart, it's the exact same thing, Thanks. but they reduce it to a quart size. How do you want to do this? And it literally uh, do you know, the other side. Yeah, that's probably good. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, just big picture summary. Um, we the the, um, the planning board is charged with um, establishing rules and regulations as it relates to building new streets, which are. Um, which is all a subdivision really is, is about the infrastructure for the construction of new streets in the city. Um, but the other um, piece of what the planning board is charged with doing, and so they're under that jurisdiction, the board has to establish rules in, um, in order to, for um, applicants to follow, and, and those, are the, those are the rules that, um, are not just guidelines, but they're hard and fast, and only the planning board adopts such rules. So you hold the public hearings to modify subdivision, changes to subdivision regulations, and you adopt them, and it doesn't go to city council or any other body. Um, the, um, a lot of this is, an, is very technical, um, relates to size of pipes, you know, the type of materials that, and how you, um, lay sidewalk and and um, roadway so we've had we've always relied on the city engineers to um, provide the technical information as it relates to those specifications and some of it comes from DOT some of it comes from other sources um, so for this revision we also worked close staff worked very closely with Department of Public Works to make sure that they were comfortable with these modifications because they're the ones who then have to maintain these streets if they are to become public streets um, as approved by City Council. Uh, the other piece of the subdivision regulations are that they, um, based on more recent case law um, and, and issues that have arisen throughout the Commonwealth, um, that 
they are need we need to apply the same standards to the private sector that we do to ourselves so we can't require certain things to be um, um, for the private development and not have the city abide by the same rules so this first um, section here is really it is very clear saying these rules also serve as a as um, technical standards for any street improvements this is city might undertake so for instance the r total reconstruction of North Street um, we really push that we have granite curbs because our subdivision standards say that um, when a new streets built we have to use granite curbs because they last you know forever and they don't break apart so um, but we wanted to spell that out in this version so there those are the two um, um, important pieces of the subdivision rules that, that um, um, are um, in this document and are what the document is used for so we've added that here um, and again sort of I've kept you up to speed as we've made these um, amendments but this represents this change and why there's so many um, red lines or blue lines I guess on the screen is that it's a another significant shift in the way we're looking at infrastructure to try to minimize the total impervious surface that we're encouraging people to build or that the city is looking at in terms of rebuilding and also encourage new ways of dealing with stormwater because stormwater has always been an element of dealing with the street network and um, the rules up to this point have really been about a piped system that takes the water somewhere else and then slowly dissipates um, and gets to the rivers and streams and goes off somewhere else. So um, this, these standards create, um, I wouldn't say necessarily incentives, but it spell out how you would incorporate um, what we're calling green infrastructure into any kind of street network construction. And that is, I think, the biggest piece that will help in terms of the city side. When we look at reconstructing, we don't anticipate that there are going to be a lot of new subdivisions in Northampton. But we do know that we're going to be rebuilding the streets that we have um, over and over. So this is also really important in terms of guiding the city on how we incorporate new ways of dealing with stormwater uh, once we go in and reconstruct streets. So a lot of the um, aspects in, the, in this um, deal with those details of when it should be used, how it should be used, and, other, and variations to the network um, that would accommodate what we're calling low impact design or green infrastructure. So, um, and we've also changed a lot of terminology. We're deleting um, some definitions that, um, so for instance, collector streets and um, you know, sort of this hierarchy of streets that has been the mantra, the engineering standard for decades. Ever, ever, yeah. um, because what we're really trying to, to talk about is are more complete streets that are focused on slower speeds and all modes of access, um, whether it's walking or bicycle or driving. Um, so a lot. Of, that's the reason for the deletion of these definitions and the addition of. Um, other items that relate, oh, in this case, critical root zone, um, defining where we want um, trees to be protected, how we want them to be protected, existing trees, so that when a project comes forward, we're not going in and, and um, cutting all the trees down just to build a road. Um, we've also had to update our digital <laughs> file standards. Um, get rid of floppy disks references and things like that. <laughs> um, so that's what this section is about. Um, again, digital files. Um, and defining, again, uh, drip lines as it relates to protecting trees. Um, and adding definitions for green infrastructure and low impact development. And so, again, we worked with DPW to make sure they were comfortable with, with this. We also know that department, because in parallel, Department of Public Works, or specifically the stormwater um, people, <laughs> were developing the utility and were focused on that. So they did not have a whole lot of time to put into the details of 
the stormwater piece of the low impact design. There's been a cursory review by Department of Public Works over this. But we also, they were comfortable enough for this to move forward knowing that if it was critical for us to go back and make amendments, we could bring those to you in bits mm -hmm. that just deal with the um, low impact design if there's some tweaking of the language to make sure it's consistent with what the stormwater ordinance um, says. But for the most part, we are consistent with that. There just may be um, things that need to be modified later. Um, and I guess the biggest thing is we don't even discuss, I mean, the, uh, there's a very limited reference currently in the subdivision regulations about low impact design. It just says, we'd love you to use it, basically, and that's it. And this goes into more detail about allowances and also more encouraging um, the use of that. And I think the next, um, and the, these are just graphics to illustrate what we mean so that it's, it can be used as a manual for any of these designers. <clears throat> um, so this is all the definition section that's at the front end of the ordinance. And then here we go to the streets type. So instead of having um, um, local streets and collector streets, we're changing the way that um, how, how we label them. And so there are four types we're proposing. Um, that we include a private alley allowance, not that we think that they're going to be alleys, but if the opportunity comes up, we want to have a set of standards that someone can go to and say, oh, your rules allow me to put an alley, so I want to do an alley. And, and frankly, we, we see that at the front end of new subdivision um, submittals, applicants come forward and um, staff might make a recommendation about doing some narrower streets or alleys. and. Applicants don't want to go down that path if there are no rules and there's no guarantee that they can get approval. These subdivision rules are sort of the guarantee. If you build according to the rules, then you have to be granted a permit. So another reason to sort of add um, a broader um, allowance for the t type of streets. Um, so uh, private street, um, sorry, private alleys, and then we've talk to you um, staff has talked a little bit about residential shared streets and I and there's been a lot of debate about whether this is an appropriate street for a public street and you know how it might work um, so what we're pitching in this is um, a residential shared street would be a private street only you couldn't petition to, for it to become a public way and Primarily, it's because the whole concept of a shared street is that there's no sidewalk infrastructure, that all the modes are sharing one piece of real estate, essentially. And it's a narrow, um, two-way street, but there might be um, curves or obstacles in the street to really force cars to be going very slowly. And the problem for Department of Public Works was, how do you plow that? How do you maintain that if you can't, if you don't have a straight stretch where you can just go down? So by making it um, a requirement that if you want to do this kind of thing, that it be private, then that takes it um, the burden of maintaining those kinds of things. So in, in other communities around the country, some of the obstacles have been tree planters or um, you know uh, stub outs, maybe curb out, bump outs. And things like that. If it's a private street, why are there standards? Because we, <coughs> that's a good question, because we want every street to abide by the same rules. Some part of it is for protection of the end user. Um, and, and the other piece of it is, um, uh, and that's primarily it, we, but we want to have, we want to make sure it's built according to, you know, high standard and not just um, you know, on the fly without really consideration of all the um, engineering details that are necessary that we might require from, you know, even it's, it's good. fine with me, but I just was trying to. And, and the other piece about this definition is to sort of, um, you know, we just went through this whole process of incorporating new design standards for the zoning for urban residential C and B. And so this is a sort of a cross-reference to the language in that zoning that says, you know, if you're going to build um, an access way from a street into a development, you need to build it according to subdivision standards, so it's either a shared street or an alley. So this also would stand for those um, site plans or special permit applications that you might see 
these would be the standards by which someone would design um, for those projects that aren't necessarily a subdivision, but um, would come through a site plan or special permit. And so it's really just adding graphics. Um, and again, we need to, this is not the final layout because we have to deal with all the deletions and that. But um, we wanted to make sure that it was clear that the text went along with a, hopefully a pretty picture <laughs> that, just, that shows what we mean. Um, and then the third kind of street is a residential yield street, which is really, and this is, would be a public street, um, but it's really a reflection of the, all, most of the streets that we have in the older parts of Northampton where you actually do have to pull over if there's a parked car and wait for the other car to come. So we have lots of examples in town of neighborhoods. So this is sort of going back and replicating the way streets were built and in order to ensure that um, the, uh, the speeds of those roads are slower and that we're not creating these wide, um, fast moving um, corridors. And then specifying that at each intersection, we want um, the intersections with other streets to be narrowed um, so that it really forces car to, cars to slow down when they're making turns. And then they can widen out. Um, to 24 feet, which allows on-street parking for the bulk of the street um, beyond that initial intersection um, uh, or mouth of the intersection. Which is actually two feet wider than we have now. Right. So currently, the standard for a basic residential street is 22 feet wide. Mm -hmm. And we still do allow on-street parking, but it's 22 feet wide all the way through, including, and actually, the curb radiuses are wider, typically. Um, so this is widening out the driving portion of it, but narrowing it at the intersections and creating it safer for those pedestrian crossings at the sidewalk. Well, it's not that tight. Interstates are 12-foot 12, 12 lanes, so in the regular street, you've got right. a right. lot of space. Right, right, right. So this is just a picture of uh, Walnut Street, I want to say, but it's basically the same idea that we already have in our neighborhoods, um, this type of street. Um, so and then snow we plows get around that all right i guess it must looks a little challenging for that but well right but we also have snow emergencies so you have to get your car off the street so the plows can get through um and that's typically what happens um and if not then yeah you might get plowed in <laughs> <clears throat> well, i'm not talking about damage to the curb and the plow and everything like that you mean where the You're, arrow is? Yeah, where the, where the curve is. Oh, I see. At the intersect. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just well, again, that goes back to why we want granite curbing. Because, um, but I think the other piece, is, I mean, there is some educational piece that the, the plow operators um, will, and, and these will be marked as well um, in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, the curb extensions. And that's what we've been trying to develop over time in any new or reconstruction of a street is try to, and what we've talked about in terms of Main Street and Pleasant Street for improvements is to create those curb extensions. So I think it'll be um, more familiar. The more that we do this, the plow operators will become more familiar with that. Um, so then the, the last street type is really the mixed use or commercial street, and it's a little bit wider. I should Um, so the, the, the total width is, is, um, 30, um, potentially 30 feet, but again, narrowing at the, um, take it away. Um, it's about the laptop. Oh, <laughs> thanks. um, so again, at the intersections and for, um, an extension back this would be a narrow area for safe pedestrian crossings and then it would widen and this is similar to what's um, been designed and built up at the state hospital where they've created a wider area for on-street parking you've also got it in downtown Pittsfield yes I think I this think picture is from that's Pittsfield. what the picture is yeah from. yeah but this also is showing so another opportunity to do green infrastructure and drainage um, from the street, so taking water from the street, filtering it through those planting, planting houses. Um, so again, what, 
eliminating the definition of subdivision type two and type one, which is was always really pretty much a residential subdivision or a commercial subdivision. We're not changing the definition of surveyor. Um, and uh, modifying um, uh, waiver allowances, and particularly in this paragraph, to encourage green development practices. Um, so th that sort of another um, reason why someone might come to you for a, a waiver. We want to um, specifically include that as a as an incentive, really, to think about different ways of handling um, development. And these are all just sort of upgrades. Carolyn, one quick note on the, the maybes there. I think there are two words, yeah? Right, uh, if you go down a little bit more. There's two words as to having 14 sets of documents and then three maybe reduced sets. Oh, yes. So there's two of them that got like concatenated into one word. Okay. Thanks. Pass them again. Yeah, it's Page 12. Okay. <clears throat> I can probably go back and do a spell thing. Not maybe, but maybe. Right. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're at the very bottom. Okay, right. <laughs> nice. Um, Okay. And um, Devin told me that I missed a planning and sustainability reference, so I'll have to go back and find that. <laughs> um, so contents of the plan, we really looked, went through and um, reorganized and, and rethought what we wanted. There was, uh, there was, there was a um, requirement requirement that applicants submit a colored plan showing the entire subdivision that was separate from the actual black and white plans. We found that it was really more paper and more resource expense and didn't really get us um, necessarily any additional information that we didn't have, so deleted that. Um, and added requirements about um, looking at the layouts of streets and trying to get south-facing um, um, access uh, as much as possible, and, um, encourage, language about encouraging low impact design, and um, incorporating, um, you know, more specificity about what you do if you want to incorporate low impact design. Carolyn, um, we should check Rio Valley Edition 2. Mm -hmm. The numbers keep going up. We have Valley Edition 3 or maybe even 4 now. We should check that. Okay. <laughs> Should I just put X? <laughs> <laughs> well, Devin knows it, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I miss <laughs> Yeah, I didn't see that on your list. Um, <coughs> and also references to DEP stormwater requirements are changing. Um, and um, let's see. I think it's probably further down here, but um, right. So here's the colored plan reference. So we're just deleting all, right. all of that, and the form of the plans, what to submit, um, and then contents of the plans. Um, just cleaning up the language. Uh, so here we've added in terms of what you need to submit with your subdivision, added more information or more requirements about trees, both on the existing properties, but also on the immediately surrounding properties. Um, and that's really just sort of 
judgment over the last several years when a sub when an application for subdivision comes in and the view just cuts off at the property but there might be big tree root zones that come across where you're planning a road and so it's important to understand where those are um, and we've eliminated we've we've proposed that that we take out the environmental impact analysis and it's and and development impact statements um, for a couple of reasons one is um, we're, we're asking for um, some of this included sort of architectural or archaeological resources we would want to see where that is but we don't necessarily need a full assessment and frankly a lot of what applicants would submit they'd go through the submission requirements and not really address what we're looking for. So it was kind of a waste of time, I guess I would say. But also, if you build according to the subdivision regulations, you, you're going to get a permit because that's what the law says. The planning board has to issue a permit. So what are we going to do with this information? It says, you know, we need, we're going to, this is going to increase um, school enrollment by 100 students. You still have to issue the subdivision <laughs> um, approval if they meet the standards. Um, and it's just cleaning up the language, clarifying. Um, and then this additional language is really sort of relocating some of the information that we had already, but um, more specificity about work limit areas and um, site disturbance and looking at ways to really design the subdivision that's um, context sensitive and thinking about um, you know what to preserve and what to where the best place for infrastructure um, and then a requirement that um, we want to know whether you're taking topsoil away because it's a valuable resource and what you're going to do with it um, and trying to encourage people to reuse it on site instead of removing it. See how easy this is? We're just whipping right through this. What page are we on now? Oh, okay. <laughs> Lighting standards, you guys are all up to speed on that. <laughs> Want to make sure it's consistent with zoning. Um, and then just cleaning up the financial performance guarantees. Let's see where the heart of this is. Come in. <clears throat> a lot more about stormwater and specificity about that and now we get to the design standards in the table for all the streets so this is where we're really talking about those the dimensions of those street widths and and the and cross sections um, and for the um, so again it's the the difference the variation of four different types of streets that we didn't have before private alley private shared street um, residential yield street which is a standard residential street and then a mixed-use commercial street um, and this is more the specificity about um, how you lay those out and um, the materials um, and um, again all of this has been reviewed by DPW and they're fine with these modifications we went through all these specific the specifics of these standards for the depth of asphalt and they made some recommendations um, so just to say you know we're not making this up <laughs> with no with no input in terms of an engineering standard at all um, and uh, these are crosswalk standards the DPW We've had crosswalk construction standards that's varied over the years as we sort of played with different models and what works. So um, uh, 
DPW is pretty um, happy with the concept of thermoplastic and ladder design, so we, we want to make sure that's in there. Um, just, uh, just a question. Uh, sidewalks, for example, on both sides of the street, uh -huh. I don't know, that's something that's been in effect a long time. I, I guess it just, you know, there are these residential areas that are fairly rural and they only kind of get the traffic that's on their street or two on their street and it just seems kind of burdensome to put have to spend the money to put sidewalks on both sides of the street when crossing the street you know it's really not a very dangerous situation um i mean i just it just seems very expensive but yeah i mean i think the issue is um Safety, we want to make sure, and some of those streets, um, you know, I think the way that streets are built um, or have been built, they could potentially be um, where fast moving vehicles are and they aren't safe necessarily to walk in the street or isn't safe to walk in the street. Um, well, I know that's the case in some areas, but I just think of a lot of the developments and that have been built way up off of Bird's Pit Road and beyond. and. You know, there's, I don't know, it just seems a little heavy handed to impose that kind of cost. And I don't, I guess, you know, I just don't know if that type of decision making, you know, and, and what types of costs you're putting on these developers, you know, to make a project go um, are considered in, uh, well, in one planning of, here. Yeah, I mean, one of the, I guess I would say on many of those streets off of Burst Pit Road where there aren't sidewalks, the streets are much wider. And we've narrowed this, over time, we've narrowed streets and required sidewalks on both sides. So in some cases, there may be somewhat of a trade-off, maybe not, you know, um, entirely a trade-off in terms of cost, putting sidewalk versus wider asphalt for cars. Um, the other uh, piece of it is those, those streets being wide, Cars can go very fast, whether or not they do, and it's not a safe situation to have pedestrians also in, in the street. Right, but the streets are narrow now. Right. Narrow. So we're not talking about those streets. Right. The, streets. the other piece of it is we have a provision that if you're doing low-impact development, um, you can either you can have no curbing for a portion of your street and potentially no sidewalk on one side, although we'd still want some kind of, you know, off street, maybe a um, path, pedestrian path. Um, but that's one way, you know, to, to change that equation a little bit, uh, potentially, is if you are then doing on-site stormwater management and you are going to do it on one side of the road, for example, so you need a green swale or an, you know, entire, entire stretch, then um, these regulations would allow you to come to the planning board and request, you know, elimination of sidewalk on one side. We should also add that every subdivision we've had now for 25 years in the suburban areas are cluster projects, so they have a lot less frontage. So they're 75 feet of frontage, all that's required. Right. So, the, so even the new subdivisions are denser than, you know, the old subdivisions spread out all of the land, so they might have had 125 feet of frontage, 150. So now that's, they are denser. We're trying to get less roads. More traffic, in other words, right, more traffic in a concentrated area, but, but less, the biggest savings we've been trying to do for developers is less roads in the first place. Shorter roads with sidewalks in the whole street. Um, the other thing, the other change in this, because the design speeds are, um, are much, um, slower in this new with these new standards that also reduces a lot of the other geometry of the street the angles of the intersection the site distances and many times applicants would come forward and ask for waivers for certain um, um, straight line you know straight line to an intersection so that you can have full site distance around the intersection and DPW's recommendation to the board would often be no, your standard says X, so we're not going to wave, and it's a big deal to wave. 
the standard, but in fact, if it, it was really based on higher design speed. So this uh, um, creates, um, it sort of has a whole domino effect on all the geometry um, and all the numbers, I guess, for the design uh, based on um, really encouraging people to build streets that are for slower speeds. And then we just ch changed graphics and requirements for cul-de-sacs and instead of having one-way cul-de-sacs instead of having um, a two-way with a big bulb at the end, think about it more as a slower one-way loop that's um, a slightly different shape. Um, let's go through here. And then these are just sections to um, show what the table is. Um, cross sections that are required for submittal but also to illustrate what the new dimensional requirements are for laying all the infrastructure under the road so we had to match that to the um, to the new table new standards in the table and then all this is just deleting the previous um, standard that's being replaced by the new table um, And again, talking about design speeds being 15 miles per, per hour for most of these streets, it's except for the commercial streets, and um, incorporating all modes of um, access. Okay, how far am I? 50. Um, this section is about um, about the sidewalk construction standards, but also incorporating more low impact design standards, particularly as it relates to sidewalks in the streets um, and what that would look like. So we had to incorporate that in, so there's specificity for applicants. Um, and more sort of beefed up the tree um, requirements and the preservation of trees and um, protection of the trees that are intended to be preserved for the um, subdivision once it's um, finished. And more examples of how you might incorporate green infrastructure into a new subdivision with, where you might not have curbs and how you would um, you know what kind of pra what kind of um, elements you would incorporate into that. Uh, another a standard to encourage um, non-potable water for irrigation. We don't have that language, but we always talk about it, so we just decided to put this in. And then um, this is a tree, the tree species. Um, we went through and looked at the tree, current tree list and tried to sort of, uh, tried to update it based on climate change and what trees might not be so viable in the future because they're really for colder zones. Um, so some of these represent deletions um, and then more specificity about the kinds of trees that might be, um, uh, that are better suited for ur in the urban context. Uh, we've also added, so I think I deleted a total of three trees based on sort of trying to project climate impacts to tree species and trees that would do better in um, Northampton based on changing climate. And then <coughs> we've also added trees that might be appropriate to be planted under utility <laughs> lines because we don't have any specificity now but applicants come before you even under a site plan submission and say well you know I need to do street trees but I have all these electric you know utility lines over my property what do I do so we wanted to spell those out so that we have a reference point for anyone not just coming in for subdivision but for special permit or site plan or site plan I should say to um, use these specific trees if you're planting under utility um, lines. And we're also working on um, a list, a short list of trees that might be appropriate if someone's truly doing, um, trying to do an edible streetscape. Um, 
and we are working in particular we we know that um, the next subdivision to come forward is probably going to be at the state hospital and there's an interest for the applicant to incorporate some edible landscape into their design so they've given us a list of trees they're thinking about and I'm currently going through and making sure that that makes sense in the context of all the other things that we've talked about well in particular our climate and our zone you know where are we changing um, you're, we're sort of in a transition zone between five and six now um, and you know what makes sense for that and then also in terms of stress and salt tolerance um, not all trees um, would work in terms of a street tree but we want to also encourage you know encourage that if people are in fact doing that that they can do that but the homeowners association would be responsible for maintaining those specific trees because if they're meant to you know for this other purpose then we need to make sure we have better maintenance of those because we certainly don't have that ability at the dpw level or any other department level to maintain edibles <laughs> So what I would say is, you know, if you want to close this discussion and make a decision tonight, that's great. If you want to see the final with some of these details, I can bring that back to you. Or um, uh, under either scenario, if we have a modification of those trees, I would bring them back to you to make sure that you're, you all are comfortable with that. <clears throat> um, So there's um, more standards about design work and trying to respect the existing topography. And um, I got comments from um, Devin about, I think you were the one that said, to the extent feasible is <laughs> not a good term to use <laughs> um, in this context. So demonstrate that they will minimize land clearing. So um, we can look at that language. But this whole section is really about um, trying to direct people to again look at the piece of property first and figure out what makes sense where it makes sense to develop and then develop in those places um, and again, in reference to topsoil, I guess I need to double check that, why it's in two places. Um, I think it has to do with design specs. Um, and then we've added this soil classification table that we've not had before. Again, DPW feels much more comfortable with having something like this in there instead of generally. We used to have um, a standard when you do soil borings that the soils are classified as um, poor, moderate, or good. Yeah. <laughs> so I think they're much happier with this. <laughs> oh, poor, medium, and good. So we'll delete that. Um, and the same with subgrades. Uh, and then more specificity about low impact design standards and how they might lay out. Now I will say that um, you can't put too much specificity about low impact design because it's all site specific in the soils that are there. So um, um, we're trying to be as um, specific as we can without, you know, dictating exactly because there's no way you can do that on a, um, you have to do it on a case by case basis. Let's see, drainage. Um, this is just updating the drainage section to be consistent with our stormwater uh, <coughs> ordinance um, on the DPW side. Uh, this is still all drainage. And then, um, again, sort of consistency with DPW as it relates to sewer um, lines. Um, and then this thing in highlight, I didn't, and this is a holdover, it wasn't intended to be, be continue to be highlighted, but um, we've had a few subdivisions now, or a couple anyway that I can think of, where everything is privately maintained, 
And so it's important to make sure that the homeowners who are buying into these subdivisions understand they don't call the DPW when they have a backup on their sewer line. So um, we want that spelled out instead of having it a permit condition. Uh, and then water line, um, just t um, upgrades and typos. Uh, and this is all based on DPW requests for modification about our water standards, water line standards. I don't know anything about those AWWA standards C600. <laughs> I just rely on DPW for that. <laughs> Um, and all of this sort of fire suppression standard that all stays the same. Um, <coughs> fees. We made some modifications to the fees. Um, there are a couple things. One, we added a fee for street acceptance. Um, we hadn't had a fee at all. When someone comes in at the end of the subdivision and requests a street be accepted by the city, there's no fee, but it takes a lot of review, a lot of staff time, a lot of back and forth checking the plans. So we thought, and, and many other communities have a street acceptance fee. So we've, um, uh, Wayne actually checked around and got a number based on what other communities were charging. So that's $3 per linear foot of street is what we're proposing. And then also request for um, release of performance guarantee. Sometimes with a subdivision, it takes you know, a long time to get through. You get multiple requests um, to reduce that performance guarantee as they build out the subdivision. Um, and we haven't had a fee. Um, at all for that so it's another just sort of measure indicating you know that it does take staff time to evaluate that so we want to make sure that we're covered for for that um, time that it takes to review um, computer upgrades no longer floppy disks um, <laughs> And same thing. So I think that's you certainly it. have a lot of ink color in there. <laughs> Next, what well, you're going to accept all those and give us a clean version, or? Um. Well, I guess I'd like to ask you. You know, if you have questions, yes. if you want more time to think about it. So move. <laughs> um. Yeah. I mean. Be like the um, like. You had the example of the trees. It, we accept this as presented, but then you have changes down the line that you bring just those changes back. Yeah, we do another sort of public hearing, but just for that right. piece. And so I guess the, the reason, you know, why it's important, I think, to move forward now, we've been talking about this for several months, is we're on the cusp of getting another subdivision submission. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure these stand, I mean, the applicant has seen this, and so they're working from this, which is a good thing, but, you know, we want to have those standards in place. Um, and then two, we've got those zoning changes that went through that reference the ty street types that are in here. And those are about to be um, voted upon by city council in the next month or so. So we want to make sure that we're keeping up pace with changes on the zoning side. Where's the subdivision going? Hospital. Hospital Hill. Did you see that they say the fees three dollars a foot? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. So if it's a mile long subdivision, it's fifteen thousand dollars. That's a long street. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> a, that's a lot of money. <laughs> so is everyone comfortable if we did that a, a, approved as presented and then to stay at least not get ahead of but stay on pace with it with all the everything else that's moving forward through the city and then if there are modifications to this we'll bring those modifications back and just talk about those okay there may be adjustments i gather with other work that's being done yet um, not so much. I mean, the only thing, um, Devin sent me a, a list of, and I printed it out, but it's on my desk, of just sort of tech, you know, 
clean up language things and a little bit um, um, of that kind of thing. And then really the only thing I anticipate are potentially two things. One is the, the edible trees I know will come back because I want to do some more work on that um, before I present it to you all. And then the other piece might be um, more language about low impact design, but my sense from Doug McDonald's DPW was that he's comfortable with what we have and if it's really necessary to make changes, you know, he'll take time to look at that later, but he's not concerned about that. So I don't anticipate that would be coming shortly. That might be down the road a little bit. And this is sort of underlying this is sort of the urban design guide. Right. They it that same way that DPW is you do. Well, so, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Um, th there's an urban design guide that looks like to me it's underneath some of this because of the low impact design and and that. And so I'm just I'm saying, does DPW are they on board with that? Yeah, I mean, I think to they're certainly on board with the direction this is going. Okay. And um, we've also had lots of conversations about what this means in terms of subdivision and how they potentially design reconstruction. Right. I, I, I'm good. <laughs> okay, so I guess we need a motion to approve the, the rules covering the subdivision as presented. I move that we approve the rules governing the subdivision of land as presented to us this evening. Do you want to also simultaneously close the hearing with that motion? Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I should have asked for public comment. Um, I'm actually surprised there wasn't. I wish there was more public comment. Yeah. I'm just feeling that I don't have enough information from both sides of the fence to really understand maybe some of the issues we're potentially creating here tonight. That's frustrating. In my view, it's... I don't know if we're creating as many as cleaning up a lot and deferring to trying to get everybody, the city and developers, on the same page. And, and when we're talking about stormwater or anything like that, we defer to DPW. When we talk about trees, who do we defer to on the trees? Or is that you looking up Wikipedia? Tree <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to say I really like the trees under power lines, but for a different reason, because you're encouraging green building. And so solar roofs that yeah, have these tall the maples well. over them, you know. Yeah. So I like that. Um, I, I, like, I like the, you know, the trees, the DPW. What concerns me a little bit is kind of this kind of, it feels like a one plan fits all. And, you know, all the streets have to be a certain width and, um, you know, kind of, you know, with sidewalks on both sides. and. You know, the beauty of Northampton, I think, is the variety of streetscapes that it has. And um, I just, the reality is there's not that many subdivisions that right. are going to be proposed right. here. So I guess I can get over that. But, um, but if the case was different, I'm not so sure I'd be supportive of, you know, everything kind of under the same plan and look. Well, just so to, um, as I started this, one of the reasons for having a sort of the rule book is that um, applicants can follow it. But by statute, you have to have a set of standards for approval of streets. And if you, as an applicant, follow what's in the book, then you auto, you get your permit. And so there's a guarantee, essentially. So um, we have to have specificity about what each thing looks like. There are um, allowances for waivers. I I'm not sure if that gets at what you're trying to, uh, what you're speaking to, but you know, this uh, came up at Village Hill, for example. When the first streets were being um, designed, they were really hemmed in to a certain extent by the old standards that were more suburban in nature and they were trying to create this other thing. So they came they came to the planning board with as few waivers as they could, but they still needed waivers from the rules because it was a different type of project. That is that allowance is still there and at the discretion of the planning board and their spec their rules about how you can grant waivers and what you need um, 
you know, what the planning board needs to see with a grant of waiver. But um, so it's a little bit different from zoning in that zoning regulations are hard and fast. And if you don't, if, if you don't abide by them, then you have to go to the zoning board for a variance or something. Um, but the reality is you have to have um, requirements for how streets are built by state statute. Okay. So we have a motion, a second, and a discussion. Any more discussion? No? All in favor? Okay. Great. 